What is going on, IB Nation? Welcome to another edition of the Combo Show. It's 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 yes, man. It is the big IB Nation Sports Talk Show. How about that? <laughs> there we go. That? I like it. I like it. So we're comboing up today. If anybody's on Twitter or wherever, and they saw that Brian couldn't do a show this afternoon because of some uh, unforeseen I circumstances, can't catch a break man, <laughs> I cannot. Like I'm renting this house out to do shows right. because they're doing construction in my house, and all of a sudden at like twelve thirty, I start hearing this jackhammer going off, and I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. But <laughs> well, it worked out because there's a will, there's a way. We, we all know that in 55 minutes, Sean Styers will be doing his thing with the women's basketball team. They're playing uh, Virginia Tech tonight at home at 7 o'clock. And so it was going to be myself and Jesse, you know, holding down the fort. And then Brian was like, hey, man, why don't we do a show together just like we would normally do in the afternoon, which hilariously earlier in the week, he's like, hey, man, can you take a day off of school so we can do a show together? Yes. And it's like. The We're gods well. were smiling. The football gods were smiling down, and uh, now we are doing a show together in the evening time. Well, and and I really wanted to talk about this topic too, Vince. That's yeah. the other thing is like right. you know we're talking about the Notre Dame cornerback room, and we're talking about stars on defense, which is kind of follow yeah. up from what we talked about on Tuesday. So I really wanted to kind of dive into this topic and 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 nice. really kind of get into get really get into it. Yeah, no, I'm. I've been looking forward to it all day ever since I found out we were going to be doing it. So we're gonna. So here's what's, what's going to happen, folks. We're going to do part one. We're going to talk about the corner cornerback room, and you know who's coming back, who's coming in, what's it going to look like, our thoughts, all that. Then we're going to move on to part two, and part two is going to be stars of the defense, just as Brian had uh, mentioned. And so we're going to talk about that. So who are the stars? Who could be a star? You know that kind of fun stuff. And then part three of the show is we're going to do some rapid fire. And so we got some questions all queued up, ready to roll. And so uh, Brian loves when he can step in and do a little bit of rapid fire with me. And so this is going to be a lot of fun. So just sit back, relax, folks, have a good time. We're, we're going to, we're going to roll with this thing. It's going to be fun. I do thoroughly enjoy the rapid fires, <laughs> but like I don't bring them onto our show. Cause like the whole point is that Sean's show is different. Right. And I don't want to take like something he does that's unique because he's been doing this since he was oh, doing yeah. on the radio show. Yep. Yep. And so that's why whenever I get a chance to come on the show, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Cause I let's do, do it. Rapid fire. That's right. And we got it. We got some good topics to talk about. Yeah. A lot of football topics, actually. It's, it's kind of that weird time of year, you know, so we're going to talk a lot of football topics, but we'll get to that. That's part three. So part one, Brian, let's kick it off here. Let's talk corner backs and Look, this was, if we're going back to 23, this was a strength for the Notre oh, Dame defense. Yeah. I mean, there, there's no doubt about it. Cam Hart, Benjamin Morrison. I mean, this was a strength of the team. And then work your way through the depth chart. They're deep. They were talented. It was a strength. Now, oh, Cam yeah. Hart, obviously, we're going to talk about what's gone, right? So, Cam yeah, Hart. Well, yeah, but first, just kind of an overview of the position, yeah, yeah. Vince, before we dive into it. It is just funny how things <clears throat> change can, can change so quickly. <laughs> on a football team. I mean, when you look right. at like 20, just as recently as 2020, like not that long ago, right? You're going into that season and you're saying, Dear Lord, don't let Kyron Williams get hurt at running back or they're screwed. <laughs> and you're like, I don't know. Oh, dear Lord, thank you for sending us Nick McLeod. Cause if you didn't do that, we oh, were yeah. screwed. I remember that. And, you know, looking at it from a Notre, you know, Notre Dame standpoint. And now just fast forward, you know, four seasons. And they're like absolutely loaded. Those were the two biggest question marks on the team that season. And now you look at it and you're like, they're just loaded at running back. They're loaded at corner. I mean, you talk about the depth chart. We're sitting there up there in the press box at the pit game. And, you know, we actually, you and I were actually outside because we spent most That's of the right. first we half up, outside. Up and over. And, yeah. you know, like, okay, we knew Benjamin, we knew Benjamin Morrison that might not play. And, you know, he's not out there. And then, like, Late first quarter, early second quarter, Cam Carhart gets hurt, and we're like, mm -hmm. "Oh no, I hope he's not hurt for a long." Because anytime he gets hurt, it's like, "Oh, it's, is it the shoulder?" Yeah, right. And he could have come back in. They just and then they put Jaden Mickey and Christian Grayer out there, and you're just like, they didn't miss a beat. Right. Against a pretty pretty decent receiving core for Pitt. I mean, it mm -hmm. wasn't they didn't have a very good quarterback, but that receiving core is pretty good. Didn't miss a beat. I mean, yeah. Jaden Mickey almost had three pick sixes that game. Like they just kept testing him, and he almost <laughs> picked off two of them and took it to the house, and then he finally. Got one. Remember that. And that took was a big back game. House. That was a big game for Jay on and off the yeah. field and everything that was going yeah, on. So, yeah, exactly, exactly. And then the 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 same thing happens, or the the later in the game, 
or you've got Christian Gray makes that crazy one-handed catch. And on that play, if he doesn't make that play, Jaden Mickey's about to undercut the route mm-hmm. behind him and pick it off. And you're just like, how many teams can can play a power five game, lose both starting cornerbacks and be like, yeah, they're fine. Yeah, you know, but that's where they were. And that's the job yeah. that Mike Mickens has done as a recruiter. Yeah, but also as a developer of players, because those guys looked comfortable met there, man. So it's just fun events as we dive into what was lost and what returns and what's new. And we ask the five big questions of the position. It is just kind of funny to look back and think about a guy that started on that 2020 team in the playoff is now buried on the depth chart. And, and I actually don't have him on the what returns list but we will talk about him during that period of time because there's some questions about where he's going to play he's kind of a jack of all sure. trades <clears throat> but he was a starter in 2020 and 2021 and now he's buried in the depth chart because notre dame is just loaded up <laughs> so much it's crazy and, and the staff likes him i mean we're talking about oh, sure. lewis obviously the staff well, likes otherwise him. They, they wouldn't ask him back they right. wouldn't have asked they, him they back always talk about C. Yeah. Lou, so it's not like oh he's terrible and let's right find, it's just they just landed better players, right? And now he can kind of do a little bit of everything. So we'll talk about him as well. It, it, but it's just it's just wild how quickly things good. What it's amazing what good recruiting can do because at the time it was, you know, top running backs don't want to go to Notre Dame and top right. corners you can't recruit top corners to come to Notre Dame and you know they're too me all you know look at me and all this and then you just can't do all this and Notre Dame's like. You know, first it was Lance Taylor at corner at running back, and then Dela McCullough says, I'll see you and raise you yeah. even more. I mean, those two guys started that, and you know, and and now Notre Dame is loaded at running back. And then Mike Mickens is like, Yeah, you can, you can recruit here. Right. You just, you know, well, I'll show you. And you also and, have to be you have to be a good evaluator of talent, yeah. obviously. And he is. And and now you get, you know, that's that's kind of how it starts, right? You bring in guys that you pinpoint that could be players right and then they excel because of the coaching and everything and now it starts turning the heads of the top guys and that's yeah. exactly what's happened right because the first group that he got was that benjamin morris and Jaden mickey class now Jade's a good player but he didn't have like an oregon usc weren't pushing for him he didn't have bama right. pushing for him good player they were able to go out and evaluate him and get him but then they went out and evaluated benjamin morrison who was not a highly ranked guy Exactly. But it came down to Notre Dame, Bama, and Washington. Now, Washington matters because, number one, Jimmy Lake was not the head coach yet. He, I believe he was the, still the D.C. Jimmy Lake had killed Notre Dame in DB recruiting. Mm-hmm. I mean, beat it for Kyler Gordon. For and, years. And, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, I remember and that. Trent McDuffie and mm-hmm. Asa Turner. And he was just killing them with secondary recruiting. Mm-hmm. And so they beat Jimmy Lake. Now, he was a terrible head coach, but he's a very good evaluator, recruiter, and developer of DBs. And so you beat them for him, and you beat Nick Saban. How often does Nick Saban go out to Phoenix for corners? That, if you Keep in mind, Nick Saban coached Alabama's corners for years. Mm-hmm. He gave it up recently, but for it's years. Very that's involved, baby. though, still. That's I mean, his the, baby. Yeah, that's still exactly. his baby, yeah. So when they're going out to Phoenix to try to get a, an underranked at the time, a three-star kid, Benjamin Morrison was a three-star when he committed. That says a lot about his talent, but that's that evaluation. And then that right. success led to them beating Ohio State and LSU to get Christian Gray and, and beating all the schools they had to beat Georgia and all those schools they had to beat to get Micah Bell, who are much higher-ranked guys, top 100 guys. Right. And then it kind of carries in. And now this last year's class, a little bit different, went back to the, the evaluation. You know, maybe guys that the re- recruiting analyst didn't think was all that good, but he loved and Leonard Moore and Carson Hopp. So – it's just been interesting to see how he's done it. It's 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 a mixture of both of the things we say you need to do in Notre Dame. If there's an elite kid that's your type of kid, go get him. We saw that with Christian Gray and Micah Bell. Right. But if you see an elite type of kid that you think has the upside to be that guy that maybe those, those you know, again, when I say they don't care about the recruiting services, it's their evaluations. You look at it now, you're just talking about an absolutely loaded, mm-hmm. loaded cornerback room, but also one with some questions, Vince, as we'll get into. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. So let's, you want to jump right in here and talk about what was lost, obviously, going from the, last year to this year. And again, corner was a strength of this team, of this defense last year. And they're losing a good one in Cam Hart. And obviously, you know, we're talking a lot about Cam Hart because we got the combine going on and everything else and what he's going to be able to do. And, where he's going to end up, but losing plus him off we have defense. the plus we have the vice president of the Cam Hart fan club, co you know co hosting. I was show kind of demoted, but it's a happy. Well, you demotion. were devoted for his mother. It, it, yeah, I mean, exactly. You know I mean? It was like, a happy demotion. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, it was exactly. a happy demotion. 
the interesting thing about this, Vince, is the reason it's 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 always important to talk about what was lost because you have to understand what these players have to step into. But in Cam's situation, this is one of the more unique losses that they're going to have. Oh yeah, because Cam played the game in a very unique style, and I don't know that they have anyone on the roster that can repeat playing the way Cam played. You know, six two and a half, really right. long arms physical run you know run defender yeah. physical screen guy super rangy i don't know that that notre dame's going to be in a position where they're going to say okay we're going to keep playing the defense the way we did and let's hope that this guy and this guy can fill the shoes that cam did this one this departure vince when you look at cam hart is going to force notre dame to say hey we're going to have to adjust and mm-hmm. play it a little bit different sure. you know cam would play a lot of man but because he was so long and rangy, they could have him play more off man, which allowed him to drive on the run game, drive on the screen game, you know, allowed him to 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 play underneath different concepts. You can mix up your coverage a little bit more to the field with Cam, and he was really a force in the run game and screen game. I mean, he he really was. And you're losing a a, a very unique player that mm-hmm. you just don't. I mean, not a lot of the other teams have a guy like him either. Sure. And and so you lose a guy like that who maybe didn't put up a lot of production in their passing game for two reasons. One is you know, his the way they used him didn't allow him to be in a ton of positions to make plays on the ball in the air. And he just hasn't been a great in the air guy, if we're being honest. But we also forget that Cam, I believe this year, Vince ranked, I, I think, I believe second in all of college football in forced fumbles. This past season with three. So this is a guy that made plays on the ball. It just was a little bit different. Actually, yeah. he was tied. He um the he was in the third group of players for that one, Vince. So the leader okay. had five, and then there were some guys with four, and then he was there with three. Okay. So he 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 impacted the game in a lot of different ways. I'm not gonna ask the guys that we'll talk about in a little bit, Jaden Mickey and Christian Gray and Leonard Moore and Clarence Lewis and and you know, Chance Tucker and let, and all these guys to kind of come in and say, hey, do what Cam did. Yeah. You're going to have to alter what you do, much more so than you have to alter with Audric being gone at running back or or Joe Alt being gone at left tackle. You're going to have to alter your defense in a, in a different – in a little bit more um, noticeable ways with him – being gone now the good thing is is corner is an easier position to kind of alter what you're doing than defensive tackle middle linebacker viper running back kind of thing because you can just say okay it's really just going to change what he does you know if if you're going to come up and maybe play more press man or different things like that where it doesn't necessarily change the whole structure of what you do it more so really impacts that position and then a little bit the nickel position so it doesn't quite have the broad you know, impact, but it is going to really change that field corner position to the point when Vince, where it's like, well, we'll get into it more once we get individual players, but I, I'll just focus on that. It's definitely going to make things look different sure. with Cam sure. not back there. Not better, not worse, just different. It's different, yeah. And that creates a question. You got to play to the themselves. strengths. You got to play to the strengths and the weaknesses of the guys that you have, right? I mean, that's, that's what good coaches do. You don't just plug in a player – into your defense, but like, well, this is what we got. This is what we're going with. And I don't see that being the case without Golden. He's going to, he is going to call a defense and run a defense to highlight where his guys are strong. I mean, that, that's, that's what we all anticipate happening. So Cam Hart's a big loss though. I mean, those are big shoes to fill. There's no doubt about it. The great thing that I talked about earlier and that you've brought up as well is the depth at, at that position of that room in general is fantastic. And so it's not a matter of if they will be able to replace Cam Hart, it's how and who I think is the is the bigger question going in, right? And so that's going to be a fun thing to kind of figure out as we move forward here, which by the way, spring practice one week from today. Yes. Well, that's going to be an exciting thing and I'm getting ready to, to pull this up, but yeah, it, it it's going to be interesting to see how they do it. And and is it one guy that kind of takes over that starting role? Sure. Is it a rotation of guys that kind of takes over that starting role? You know, those are the things that we'll have to ask ourselves, Vince, when it when it comes down to, you know, how do you re- replace Cam Hart is it's not just what 
changes do you make schematically, but also what changes are you going to make how you handle your personnel? Where Cam was yeah, the starter, yeah. you'd have a normal rotation with the you know the backups getting in every third or fourth series. Is it going to be different now? Does somebody step into that? So again, we're going to address this even in more detail when we get to the questions part. But that's the that's what we're going to have to find out here as we transition into the spring, and it's going to be, you know, look what you see day one. Is most yeah. likely what not what you're gonna is is not what you're gonna see on day fifteen. That's fair, right? And and then what you see on day fifteen may not be what you see on day one of fall camp, which may not be the same as what you see on day fifteen of fall camp. Yeah, and then game day. It's just this is when the battle takes this form of now you're putting pads on and we're gonna see what guys are made of and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, absolutely. They're gonna tease us too, Vince. Like they're gonna give us that one practice and then they go on right. spring break and then we're back in eleven days. But I'm excited about it. Very excited. Well, and they're and they're going to tease us also by putting a bunch of guys out there. They're, I I I fully expect to see, you know, everybody cut. Not everybody, but people getting a shot at at these positions, right? And and you know, that's what spring practice is all about, though, too. And so you talk about, you know, we might see something different on day one or day fifteen of spring practice, and you're going to see everything else in between. You know what I mean? Because that's what spring is for. This is when you experiment. This yep. is when you try. This is when you see kind of, hey, test guys. How's it going right. to work? You know, what's this going to look like? How how is this guy going to work with this guy? Because remember, the field side is going to be working like you kind of mentioned already. Field side works with the nickel, right? And so, what does that look like? Are these guys communicating properly? You know, that kind of thing. And so, it is going to be a full spring. I I would think a full spring and 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 a good chunk of fall before things start to get cemented unless one guy just absolutely takes off, which I guess it's could is happen. an absolute possibility, but spring is about experimentation, man. And when you've got an opening like this and you've got the depth that you've got, that's what excites me. And that that's, yeah. that's where we're going to be like, Oh, okay. So-and-so's out here today. Right. Uh, he's, he's, he's balling out. Okay. Yeah. You know, well, that's competition what hope happens. It. Vince is like, it, yeah. it, obviously what you're saying is like spring is, is not about experimentation from, that's you do that everywhere, but it's that's the time that you do those things. Yeah. If it's oh, yeah. if the need is there, right? And yeah. hey, yeah. let's see how this guy handles. Hey, let's see if this guy can can play safety. Right. Let's see if this guy can fit at the nickel where you're not experimenting or trying it out while you're in a situation where you've got a game that Saturday. You know, those those are the absolutely things. yeah. Because you got no game to prepare for. Look, the blue right. gold game is just a practice. That's not it's teaching th- time. This correct. is all teaching time yes. and those type of things. And absolutely. And, and again, this is what was lost. But once you start getting into what's and, and and Vince, I had this conversation the other day with with running back. It's 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 hard to talk about this position in a way that doesn't come across as disrespectful to the guy that was lost. You know, it's like I said, you know, absolutely. Look, Audric was a stud. I mean, he was the offense this year. Mm-hmm. And and being excited about what's coming down the pike doesn't mean I'm happy Audric's gone. He wasn't that good. You know, oh, they're going to be just fine. It's like that, saying they're going to be fine is not a shot at the kid that's gone. Yeah. It's a compliment and a praise of the ability to be able to kind of reload. Sure. And that's where Notre Dame is a corner. But Vince – when you talk about what's coming back, yeah, it really starts first and foremost with one guy. Oh, no question. Yeah, B- Benjamin Morrison. For those listening on the podcast, is uh, the the guy we're talking about here. Obviously, had an amazing freshman year. He was an All American, uh, freshman All American candidate, or no, not candidate. He was, he was a, a freshman, freshman All American. Yeah. That, uh, that that stands for way too early. A lot of people okay. have him on their 2024 way too early all American for good teams, reasons first or second team exactly yeah for good reason I mean you know you look at the stats that he had you know he was much more active obviously when you look at the breakups much more active with the ball in the air but that's also because the ball came to him a little bit more often uh, as well and he was which breaking is always going to happen when absolutely. you're the boundary guy I mean yeah like, for like, sure here's the thing with 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 Benjamin Morrison Vince I don't know that Benjamin was quite as dominant as I as maybe I had hoped he would be as a sophomore. He was kind of the same guy he was as a freshman, which is pretty good. I think at times he got a little grabby. He wasn't as good in the run game. So the thing that's crazy about Benjamin, I'm saying this to say this next point, he wasn't great in 2023 compared to yeah. what our expectations were. Agreed. 
But the reason, the thing that excites me is there's so much room for him to get better potentially. The big question for Benjamin, and well, actually, we'll get to the big question about Benjamin in the big questions part. Let's just talk about his game because what he's shown the last two years is the one thing, no doubt about it, that he can do. He can flat out cover. And he his production is is elite. I mean, you're talking about 13 oh, yeah. passes defense last year. I'm going to bring up some pro football focus numbers here in a little bit that show different numbers. So just so you understand, pro football focus has their own data. This is the official data for Notre Dame last year. Uh, 31 tackles, 10 breakups, 13 interceptions, and only two years at Notre Dame. He's had 14 pass breakups and nine <laughs> interceptions. You know, that that's that's 23 passes defensed in just two seasons. That's really good production. Mm-hmm. But when you when you stack him up against the some of the top cornerbacks in the country, what I wanted to do is I I think the three best cornerbacks coming back next year, in my opinion, are Benjamin Morrison, Will Johnson, and Denzel Burke. Will Johnson in Michigan, Denzel Burke, Ohio State. The guy that's getting all the love from the national media is Travis Hunter. And of so what course. I wanted to do is just kind of show their their production and, and things like that to just show how Benjamin stacks up against those guys. And when you look and, and I think they're they're people are correct. In like Will Johnson's getting a lot of preseason love, it's justified. Denzel Burke's getting a lot of preseason love, it's justified. But you'll see why why Benjamin Morrison is also getting a lot of preseason love. Like ESPN came out with their way too early top 20, you know, 24 All America team. They had Benjamin on the second team, and I think Denzel Burke on the second team. They had Will Johnson and Travis Hunter on the first team. And I'm, I'm going to get into the Travis Hunter thing here in a second. Mm-hmm. But when you look at the numbers, obviously Benjamin gets tested a lot because he's the boundary corner. And you saw you saw this past season, you know, it gave up a few more completions. So he's he he was targeted 51 times each of the last two seasons. Now, he played a lot more snaps this year than he did last year. So that's you know, true. that factors into it as well, where he 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 played a little bit early, but he didn't really take over as like a full time, you mm-hmm. know. 50 plus snap a game guy until later in the year. So he played a lot more snaps this season than he did the year before. Uh, just give you the number here real quick. He played 621 snaps this past season and he played, actually he didn't play as, actually the numbers were actually a little closer than I thought. 611 snaps last year. So 10 more snaps this season than he played last season. Hmm. Uh, covered snaps. Let's see what the difference is there. Uh, yeah, what's interesting, Vince, he actually played 36 fewer covered snaps this year just because of the way the game shaked out and Notre Dame winning early and things like that. But but he did that on 10 fewer snaps. He gave up three more completions, which is why his completions allowed is higher. But if you look at it, he gave up fewer yards on those three additional completions, but 17 fewer yards. So he was lower in yards per reception, lower in yards per target. He gave up three touchdowns, but what's interesting about those three touchdowns, they were all on scrambles. He oh, gave up gotcha. a touchdown pass on a scramble against NC State, where he lost a guy in the corner, or no, uh, he a guy beat him in the middle. He uh, uh, he lost, and I don't even think it was his guy technically that he that scored on him. He lost a guy on a scramble against Louisville. If you remember in the back corner of the end zone, I sure do. And then USC late in the game beat him on Brendan Rice beat him on a scramble play over the middle of the field, like right at the end zone. So all of his touchdowns this season were given up on scramble plays. They weren't like a guy beat him on a go route or a post route or a crossing route, something like that. He had 11 pass break or 11 passes defense to to pro football focus compared to eight last year. You look at Will Johnson. Will Johnson gave up or Benjamin Morrison gave up 12 more receiving yards than Will Johnson on 13 fewer targets. So as you can see, Will Johnson, who plays in a league that they don't throw the ball a lot. Sure. Uh, YPR stands for yards per reception. YPT stands for yards per target allowed. You can see his numbers were better than Will Johnson's in yards per reception allowed by four and a half yards. He was one and a half yards better on yards per target. He didn't give up any. Will Johnson didn't give me a touchdown. He had six total passes defensed. Benjamin had 11, according to Pro Football Focus. Denzel Burke had a phenomenal year this year for Ohio State. You can see very similar numbers, same number of completions allowed. Benjamin did it on three uh, more attempts against him. Uh, very similar yards. Benjamin gave up two more yards than Denzel on three attempts more. Yards per reception are very similar. Benjamin did a better job on yards per target. Denzel gave up one touchdown. Benjamin gave up three. Benjamin had 11 
total passes defense. Denzel had eight. So these are three of the best corners in the country, and you can see very comparable numbers. Sure. What I did in the second category, Vince, is I compared them through their first two seasons, which I thought was an interesting way of looking at it as well. Now, Denzel was a junior this past year, whereas Benjamin and Will were both true sophomores. So you'll see that Benjamin has been thrown at 14 more times than Will the last two years, but has only given up two fewer, two more completions. Even though he's been targeted 14 more times, he's given up 45 fewer yards than Will Johnson, and he has 19 passes defense compared to 12 for Will. Now with Denzel, I gave you two different looks, Vince. I gave you the last two years when they were all three playing at the same time. Right. The second category is what Denzel did his first two years. A, yeah. So you can see freshman and sophomore comparisons. So um, you see, you see again, Benjamin stacks up well where he's either better or as good than them in every category. Will and Denzel, the last two years, Benjamin has given up fewer yards receiving, even though the receptions is the same. He's allowed 47, Will's allowed 45, Denzel's allowed 47. Benjamin has given up uh, 45 fewer yards than Will. He gave up 30, what's that, 34 fewer yards than Denzel, so lower yards per reception, low, significantly lower yards per target, same amount of touchdowns as Denzel, more interceptions than any of them, and more total passes defense than any of them. So the numbers are as good or better than both of those guys. Now, the last category is looking at all these players as true freshmen. Now, I get that Travis Hunter is a great story. He's a great talent. This is th I know this is not Travis Hunter's freshman year of college. This is his freshman first. I count as his freshman year of D1 because he, okay. he was at Jacksonville, Jackson State the first that, year. That was, that was, that was what I was going to ask. Yeah. I thought he was a year it's two It's impossible kid. to compare. You, yeah, you can't compare that. that level to no, one no. So this is his first year at Division One level. So I'm counting it as gotcha. his freshman year. Fair at enough. This level. So when you look at it, I, I, Tra Travis Hunter's a great talent, and this is not a knock on Travis Hunter at all. This is a knock on the hype machine that surrounds Travis. Oh Hunter. yeah, that's or, more of my problem. Or the entire Correct. University of Colorado. Now but... it's awesome <laughs> that he plays both ways and sure. all that. But the fact is, is you want to make him a first team all purpose player, all for it. There's no, there's really not many anybody else in college football outside the kid at Utah that does as much on both sides of the ball as Travis Hunter. But to name him a preseason first team All American is garbage, in my opinion. And you just look at the numbers. I mean, just just look at the numbers, Vince. They they tell a very clear story. You look at what Benjamin did as a true freshman. Travis gave up eight more completions on only two fewer attempts. Benjamin, 43.1% completion rate. He was 49 this year, both significantly better than Travis, who gave up a 56.6% completion rate. Benjamin, in two years, has only given up 575 yards in 26, 25 games. In, was it 10 games this year? Travis Hunter gave up 414. He's given up 13.8 yards per reception compared to Benjamin's 13.5 as a freshman. He gave up 7.8 yards per target as a, as a first-year guy at Colorado. Benjamin only 5.8. Travis Hunter gave up five touchdowns this season. Think about that, Vince. Benjamin Morrison's only given up four in two years. Right. And Travis Hunter's given up five in one. You know, teams were not afraid of him this year. Actually, he only no. played nine games. He only played nine games this year, Vince. That's a lot he, of attempts yes. in his direction in nine games. Correct. I mean, and you watch the Stanford game, they were purposely going after him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he gave up 11 catches for 158 yards in that game. I mean, Alec Ayo Manor was just abusing him in that game. Now, I think it's partly because they play him too much. Oh, that sure. First game back, and he had sure. missed several games, and they played him both ways. Like, yeah. that was a bad coaching decision. Mm -hmm. But the fact is – even though I think he could very well be as good as any corner in college football if he focused just on corner. Right. The fact is, is they don't let him do that. He spreads too it thin. Yeah. It affects his play at corner. Right. So he should not be a guy, in my opinion, that is considered a first team All American, in, in, in my view. And here's another fact you want to look at what Pro Football Focus said he did as a true freshman. He gave up uh, 16 catches for 285 yards at Jackson State as a freshman, had 10 total passes defensed. 
So even if you looked at his Jackson State numbers, he still gave up more. You know, he he gave up. Uh, let's see here in 592 snaps. Uh, hold on a second. So Benjamin had 611 snaps as a freshman, and you see there gave up 297 yards uh, in 503 snaps. So that's 108 fewer snaps. J J uh, Travis Hunter gave up only 12 fewer yards than Benjamin Morrison on 14 fewer attempts. He had, gave up 17.8 yards per reception as a first-year guy at Jackson State. At Jackson State, State. State. yeah. So Benjamin Morrison numbers were every bit as good as Travis Hunter's while he was playing at Notre Dame compared to Travis Hunter playing at Jackson State. So, uh, again, I think it's ridiculous to not have Benjamin Morrison ahead of him. Now, you want to argue Denzel Burke ahead of him? I wouldn't have him there. I would have Johnson and Will Benjamin Morrison first team. That, that's what I would do. But if you wanted to argue for Denzel Burke, Denzel was excellent last year. He had a down sophomore year. He bounced back really well last year. So I'm okay with that. But Travis Hunter shouldn't be in this conversation until he proves he can actually play cornerback yeah. at a high level. And he has not done so yet. Well, but, and I don't think they're going to give him an opportunity to do right. so because they're they they still need him to do both. To Very true. yeah, you know what I mean. So I I don't see them allowing him to specialize because they're going to run that hype machine of of being the two way player and all that. Right. And and he and his well, numbers not only are that it, it helps them win. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, for it, sure it, they need. And I would argue they need him more on offense than they do on defense. I would agree with that because yeah. he is by far their best player on offense. Mm -hmm. I mean, by far. And, you know, I, it's almost like, Hey, I know you're not going to be very good on defense, but you're not very good on defense with him. You're right. You know what I mean? Like, right. At least let him go dominate where you have a better chance about scoring people. Right. On offense. Right, right. I mean, the kid had three games last year with over hundred yards receiving and another one with 98. But I mean, that's why that's where they, I right. mean, look, they, did they have issues scoring at times last year? Sure. But that wasn't the biggest problem that they had. Their problem was they couldn't stop anybody. Right. Because they mean, would lose even if they did score. It was shootouts. Was problem. You know, it was right. shootouts that they were losing. And yeah, so. But what this shows, Vince, is that Benjamin Morrison is, is in fact, and by, by the film tells you this, the statistical breakdown tells you this, the raw stats tell you this, he's one of the best cornerbacks in the country. I agree. And I think he's got a chance to be even better. And, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. But this shows you. What the, the point of this whole focus here is it's not just, you know, as Notre Dame fans, you, are, are we hyping this kid up because he happens to be the best corner that Notre Dame has had in several years, or does he really stack up against the best corners? And the fact is, is he really does stack up against the best corners. I mean, even if you put him up against some of the, the best cornerbacks in college football, I mean, Terry and Arnold from, from Alabama gave up 441 yards last year. Uh, the kid from Toledo that everybody's talking about gave up 290 yards last year. Kalen King gave up 290 yards last year. So, you know, Benjamin stacks up with the, with the best cornerbacks in college football mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. Uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry gave up fewer yards, but he had a 48.7 completion percentage allowed. He only had four total breakups plus interceptions. Benjamin had – so it's a 48.7% completion percentage. Benjamin was a 49 you know, Benjamin just got targeted more, mm -hmm. whereas Terry and Arnold got targeted more at Alabama than Kool-Aid McKentry because of the positions they played. So it, you, you, any metric you use, he stacks up as, among the best corners in the country. And I don't even think he played to his full potential last gonna, year. And that That's was going to be thing. that was going to be my next point was that he didn't play as well as we thought he would play and as well as he could play right. last year. He's and still so, very good. Oh, and right. but that's the right. thing. Like he, the floor was incredibly high already. He just didn't hit his ceiling for sophomore year, in my in, in our opinion, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and so that's what's exciting about this year is even with a quote unquote down year for Benjamin Morrison, okay. And I I'm I'm giving the air quotes for a reason. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't even say down year, Vince. How about how about we say this? Even though he didn't take that giant leap in year two, yeah, he was still pretty good. Because I don't know if I'd say he had a down year. Okay, I mean, I think I, the numbers show you he's one of the best corners, and, the and that's what I was going to say. Even right. with a I, I was going to use the word down year when yeah. quotes, but like his numbers still stack up with the best corners in the country. Yeah. Right? So, so how down of a year really he, was it? But that's what I say. It wasn't yeah. a down year. Right, it right. just wasn't like, I thought he was going to be a little bit more dominant and he, ne he wasn't sure. part of that is Cam's fault <laughs> because Cam was so good. The yeah. teams were like, yeah, we're going to still try to throw Benjamin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You're not uh, wrong. 
but you're also going to get stacked up against some really good receivers this year. And the, and the thing is, when you did watch Benjamin play, when he was getting beat, it was like he had guys had to work for it. Yeah. You know, what I mean, Deion yeah. Colsey beat him, or not Deion Colsey, but uh, Bo Collins beat him a couple times against Clemson. But man, they were great routes. And when he didn't run a great route, he was getting locked down. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's like it was almost like when when Benjamin did get beat, it was almost like kind of like wow, Benjamin Benjamin gave up three receptions that game. Yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, kid gave up twenty five catches the entire year. That's an average of just over two a game. You know what I mean? It's like I do. Yeah. You know, the fact that you're trying to find a way to say, you know, down whatever, and I understand where you're coming from. Vince. Yeah. This isn't a, this isn't a, a no. Shot it's just hard you, to but it's just like articulate. Yeah. Right. Right. When you're watching it, you're just like, you know, like, uh, yeah, I thought maybe he'd be a little bit better, but it just it, because that's the bar he set for himself. Right. By right. how he good he was the second half of his freshman season. But, you know, I mean, it just it, it goes to show Vince that that, that uh, I mean, this is a kid, Vince, if you look at it, the most yards he gave up all year was against Clemson or against Stanford. Huh. And he that was 79. I mean, he 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 didn't give up more than 79. That was the only game all season. He gave up more than 50 yards receiving in a game, according to pro football focus. That's nuts. Like that, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Right. And 60 of those 79 were yards after catch. I'd have to go back and look at that. They had a 53-yard gain that he gave up. So it was like a uh, missed a tackle, and they picked up yards after. You know, so. It's one big play kind of right ruins that whole thing. You right. Know? So think about that big play that came in the last game of the year. Right. And that, that went for 53 yards that basically jacked up his entire number. Think about what his numbers would look like if you take that play out. And if I remember correctly – I think Notre Dame was, had started to pull away by that point in time, if I remember correctly. But it just – I mean, again, we're talking about a kid that did that. My point is the fact that we kind of even have that little bit of a feeling of, I don't know if he was as good as I'd hoped he would be, and he was still as good as he was, mm-hmm. speaks volumes about what the expectations were for him. Yes. Uh, yeah. And it was a running back out of the backfield is what it was. It wow. wasn't even against a receiver. Remember that now? It was EJ Smith out of the backfield. I remember the big play. I yeah. just didn't, I, I guess I didn't realize. So I think, yeah. Ben was on. So him. it just, again, it speaks volumes about how, 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 how good he was as a freshman and how, yeah. just how good he is. And then we'll find out here if he can be that. Cause that's what they need him to be, Vince. And we'll Absolutely. get into it later. They need him to be that dude. Yes. No question yeah. about it. Because now Cam's gone. And yeah. so you've got that leadership role in the corners room. You know whether they're going to be combined with the safeties or not. That's you know that that's semantics. We're talking about the we're talking about the corners, right? And Cam Hart, as good as he was on the field, he, I mean, you could argue he was even better off the field as a leader well, and and all. He got that. asked that at the combine. What was the what was the th- you know thing he's most proud of his accomplishment in our name? He said being named captain. Yeah, I mean that's kind go. of kid Cam right now. Now Benjamin's a little different than Cam. You know, there was times I was told Cam got up front team and went off a little bit when things weren't going right. I don't see Benjamin doing that, but that doesn't mean he can't still be a leader. You exactly. lead by example. Yes, exactly. You lead right. by your knowledge. You lead yes. by by holding other guys accountable, yeah. in, in, whether it's in your way, right? You know, and and that's going to be something that's expected of and, him this year. Because and I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't even ask him to be that leader for the team. I need you to be that leader in the room, like that. That's where I need you to be that leader because but so he, much leadership he, he is gone. He can still do that with the rest of the defense. Sure. By you show up every day and. Right by the, example, the work yeah. example. And right. if guys aren't doing it, then you can say, "Hey, come on, buddy, I need you to get going." You know, right. and and maybe he does take that jump. Maybe his personality yeah. is such that now that he's older, he will take over that leadership mantle. Mm-hmm. And and we'll find out because, because he didn't have to. I mean, he right. you know what I mean. He Cam Hart was right there. He didn't have to Correct. be that guy, and that's okay. And yeah, JD and Jack and absolutely. Harris and There's so Howard much and, leadership, man. so much leadership on that defense. He didn't have to. He just needed to go out there and play. You know, yeah. It, yeah, it's almost like a torch pass at this point. Yep, yep. You know? And the, the torch is going to be passed from a positional standpoint to somebody else, and that's where we kind of get into the next part of what's back fence. Is there's some very talented players ready to step into that role and battle in at that yeah. that that field cornerback position? Yeah, you're not kidding. We we've got on, on our list here of what returns. We've got Christian Gray, who's a sophomore, gave up thirty six point eight percent. Completion seven of 19. 
last year. <laughs> that's fantastic. That that's what Christian did, at, right? In his freshman as a, year, as a true freshman, mind Correct. you, Correct. with three <laughs> passes defense. Yeah, right, right. And then Jade Mickey is a sophomore, a true sophomore who's gotten a ton of playing time in his first two years. Right, right. G- gave up forty five percent in his sophomore year with three passes right. defense. Now, when you look at Christian too. And you think about, okay, how did he play when the, the the lights were the brightest? Okay, when he had to step into the starting lineup, essentially, when Cam and Benjamin were both out. And that was against Pitt. In that game, he gave up two catches on seven attempts, 28-6% completion rate. He gave up 30 yards, and he had a pick in that game. And a, not, not just a pick. Like you, you gotta really gotta put one. You gotta put an yeah. You gotta yes. put an asterisk next to that. A pick. ridiculous one-handed yeah. interception yeah. in that game. Uh, and then he played against Stanford a bunch in that game as well. They they threw at him four times, so he played a lot in the last two games. Mm-hmm. Obviously, played a bunch in the bowl game because Cam didn't play. Right. And in the last two games, when he did play a lot, they threw at him seven times. He gave up one catch for eight yards. That that like. Like he gave up his first big action of the season against a good team was against NC State. He gave up 37 yards on two catches on th- only three attempts. Right. After that, the rest that was early September. After that, think about this, Vince. He gave up five catches on 16 attempts and only gave up what was that 50, 49 yards in the last 10 games of the year. Cam. Christian did. Like as a true freshman, right? And you like, and I, I were like joking I saying that. Yeah. You and I were joking up on the uh, uh, during the game, in and, 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 uh against Pitt. You're like, dude, like I, I honestly didn't even notice that Benjamin wasn't out there. N- not, not like the point being, they look so similar yes, physically. Like body type is almost yes. identical to Benjamin. And they were wearing their Christians they wear their uniforms kind of similar. You yes. know what I mean? Like well, was... in the bowl game, Vince, the only way I could tell the difference is because Christian had long white sleeves on. Yeah. Right. Because like 29 versus 20. Yes. Very similar height, weight, length. Right. And and so that's what I meant by you couldn't tell the difference. It wasn't right. necessarily say, oh, Christian's better than Benjamin. It just like physically they look so similar. Right. And right. then obviously Jaden looks a lot different. And and Jaden's situation is just you we've been talking a lot about him since he got to Notre Dame. He just made an immediate impact and he's a, he's a really gutsy kid. He's a completely different type of player than Christian. And this is kind of what we'll get into here in, in a little bit during the questions part is, is cause like when he's in the game, you've got to play a little bit more zone, which is why Pitt almost got in trouble a bunch. Cause they kept thinking they're playing man, mm-hmm. but Notre Dame was playing zone. So Jay, uh, Jaden was squatting on those routes and they're so used to those routes being like, you know, man trails that he was jumping those those plays. Whereas Christian's more of a pure man guy, you know. And so that's that's what makes it a little bit interesting because the, the two guys battling for the job, Vince, for that starting job opposite Benjamin are very different players. Mm-hmm. Both very good, but very different players. But, you know, I, I'll always have a little special place in my heart for Jaden Mickey, Vince, because of the fact that what he went through this year – I don't know if I could have covered the game if I lost one of my parents the night before, much less played. Right. It. Yeah, absolutely. And it just speaks volumes about the type of of young man that that Nyla raised. That's just the reality of it, you know. And and he he really is just a special spe- a young man and a very unique young man. I mean, the biggest talker on the team. Nobody talks more than Christian than Jay. Nope. You know, I mean, nobody's going to talk as much trash as trash as mm-hmm. trash as Jaden Mickey. He's a very confident kid. There's no doubt about that. And as you said, he's a guy that is a pretty good football player. He got targeted 20 times last year, gave up nine catches. It's pretty good football. One interception, two pass breakups. So two very, very good football players battling for that job. And, and he's another guy too, Vince, that down the stretch, he had to play a lot more football. Against Pitt, when he had to step in and kind of a starter, they get targeted him five times. He gave up two catches for 27 yards, had a breakup and an interception that he ran back for a touchdown. <laughs> That's what he did in that game. Right. Then the last two games of the year, he plays a lot more. He gets targeted eight times, gives up three receptions for 39 yards, and has a breakup. So, you know, a, 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 again, that's a kid that that when he played more, he actually was better. Mm-hmm. than he was 
uh, in in mop up duty. So like when he was in the three games, he played a lot of legitimate snaps. He actually only gave up a thirty eight point five percent completion rate. His other catches he gave up were in some of the mop up games that he played earlier in the year. So um, you know that that actually kind of speaks a little bit to how he performed as well. But he also got a lot better. As right, the year and went those on. and those mop up minutes are different than regular minutes because of the way that they're playing the defense and you know just different it's just a different thought process it's a different mindset when you're in there and i'm not saying i'm not i'm not making excuses for why there was catches made or or whatever but you know a lot of times you're playing off a little bit i mean you're not as aggressive you know things like that jade mickey is a guy that i feel will play the best when the lights are the brightest because that's just his mentality you know what I mean? And, and again, not saying he didn't play well when he came in in mop up duty, but he's just a guy, man, when the bell, when he answers the bell, like he is a guy that he almost needs to have that spotlight and that, you know, the big moment and that whole thing. And so, you know, whoever, honestly, whoever wins that cornerback job, or even if it's a split situation. Yeah. I, so I like, yeah. It. We'll dive into that a little bit uh, here in a little bit, Vince. But here's one thing I do know. However it checks out, they're both going to play because they both played last year. Agreed. They're both going to play. Yeah, you also have Chance Tucker, the position who in, an, in in past years at Notre Dame would be a backup. I mean, he'd be in the rotation at Notre Dame in past years. Right. You also have Clarence Lewis. Now, I don't have Clarence Lewis on this one because I think Clarence Lewis is not going to be a pure corner this year. He He played a little bit of corner last year, but he played mostly slot. He played mostly in the nickel this past year. Uh, I also think you're going to see Clarence do some safety work this spring. So the reason that I don't have Clarence on this sheet, but I did want to talk about him is because number one, having a guy like, like Clarence Lewis, who has started in a playoff game for you, started in an ACC title game for you, you know, started against Clemson earlier. And I mean, you know, he, he's he, or played against Clemson in 2020 or in the regular season as well. He's played a lot of snaps for you, started games for you, set some really good moments for you. Having a guy like him is a great insurance policy in case, God forbid, something happens where one of your guys gets hurt and is going to be out for a long time. You sure. can easily slide Clarence right back at corner, and he can be part of that rotation, if not a starter for you. Ideally, you don't want him starting because I just don't think that in this particular style of defense, his game is ideally suited for it. Like I've said this before, Clarence Lewis would be a much better corner at Notre Dame if he played on like Bob Diaco's defense, which was like a cover two, you know, play downhill. He would have fit uh, Clark Lee's defense better as well. That's the defense he was recruited to play in. I mean, he was recruited, to which was more, um, you know, more zone oriented in different ways. It wasn't the press man stuff that we're seeing now. Right. Clarence is, is more of a zone guy. And, mm -hmm. and so – you had you could adjust a little bit if he had to be that guy. Ideally, though, you're having him in the nickel playing as a safety, and then he can also maybe get a little bit of work outside. But I do think this is the year we do finally see Clarence playing a little bit of third level than we saw in the past because of the depth here. But it is so nice to have a guy like Clarence Lewis as your jack of all trades in the secondary. Absolutely. It, it really is. It really is. Well, and there's still – I mean, look, there's still question marks in some areas where I'm not saying that he's going to step up and be a starter. That's not that's not the point that I'm making. But there there's question marks at the second safety spot, right? There there's question marks at the nickel spot. Nothing set in stone at either one of those positions. And a guy like Clarence Lewis, at the very least, will give you depth at those positions and will give you quality minutes at those positions if asked, because he's a guy that you can trust. Right. And you know they would not have asked him back for a fifth year. Sure. If that wasn't the case, yeah, I mean that's they they love them. They they the coaches love them. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about that. There is no doubt. And so he adds depth. He adds a leadership quality to the room as well. You know, whether it's a safety room or whether it's the corner right. room or however they're going to do it, right? Uh, he adds a, a leadership quality and he adds depth. And that's yeah. guys that that is a a valuable guy to have Ver on and your versatility. Roster. The versatility, yeah. 100%. He can, he can play either corner spot. He can play nickel. Yeah. And I think he can play. I, I think he could be a really good safety if I, the need is there. I, how I really long have we been saying yeah. that? I mean, I, I do. A long time. Yeah. And and so the other thing, so <clears throat> when you look at Christian Gray, long, smooth, instinctive, and fast, right? 
Jaden mm-hmm. Mickey, short, squatty, you know, real kind of really good change of direction. Not necessarily the burner, burner, long speed that other guys have. Still can get a little bit too aggressive at times. That's something he's going to have to continue to work on. And that's just kind of always who he's going to be. And if he's your starter, you're just going to have to tailor your coverages to do that. You just are. Sure. And and Clarence is a little bit more like Jaden stylistically. You know, that you're going to run similar coverages with Jaden that you do with Clarence and vice versa. Jaden's just a little bit twitchier, a little bit more explosive, in my opinion, than Clarence. And that's why I think Jaden's able to stick there. Christian is more of that just smooth, fluid, Benjamin Morrison, just pure cover type at that position. So that's kind of what comes back, Vince. And then yeah. there's what's new. Now, I'm cheating a little bit. Yeah, you did. I noticed I'm, it earlier. I'm putting Micah Bell here <laughs> as what's new because they did redshirt him last season. Yes. And so I I want to kind of focus on him um, here. As what's new, because it's what's new to what the rotation was last sure, year. Sure, a little bit. No, absolutely. I think that's smart, actually, because thanks. He what? He what? No problem. He wasn't part of the rotation last year. He wasn't really in the mix, right. and he's a red shirt, so he's, at, you know, he's a freshman, right? I mean, he is available for all yeah. the freshman stuff. He's a freshman, and so he's still what's new to this team even though we know who Michael Bell is, we know what he can do coming in, but yeah. we don't know what he can do in this defense because we haven't seen well, it yet. The thing about Micah, and we, we, I love them coming out. As you can yeah. see, I gave him a top 100 grade, and I don't regret that decision at all from the things I've heard about him. The, the, the thing we always knew was he was going to need time. Mm-hmm. You know, like I thought maybe there's a way they could get him in some return game stuff, but they just had so many other athletes there. Yeah, I mean, you had yeah. Jordan Faison, you had Jadarian Price, you had – Jeremiah Love, you didn't necessarily need him. And they made the decision, like, this kid needs a lot of technical work. So let's preserve a year, and then he'll still have that time. Yeah. Maybe he – you know me, I'm not a big fan of redshirting skill players. I'm not. But that's the decision they made. But when you when you look at him, he's a kid, Vince, that is going to play a lot more slot this year than he did outside. That's what I'm being told. Okay. That he's a guy that's going to kind of groom behind Jordan Clark, and they're hoping, knock on wood, that he can go out there this year and kind of show himself to be part of that slot rotation. Because remember, last year they rotated uh, – Thomas Harper was great, but they played Clarence Lewis in the slot. Like They rotated there just like they did outside. They're going to do that this year, and the hope amongst the staff is, according to my sources, is they're hoping that Micah Bell is that guy that takes hold of that number two job, which then frees them up to use Clarence – as kind of that that boundary backup to Benjamin, but also yeah, a guy that can play some in the, on the back end as in part of the safety rotation Okay, back there as well. So they need Micah to step up because Micah is the key to fe- be, be feeling like you have the freedom to move Clarence. That's what it boils down to. So uh, there's he's, but here's the thing I was told about Micah. The speed is obvious. He's on the shorter side, 5'9 and a half, 5'10" super raw kid, more of a track kid learning to play football. Sure. And in high school, he was even more dynamic as a running back because you could just hand the ball and just just go. Yeah. Truly game breaking speed. I mean, he is the fastest player on the team and I don't know that it's close. I mean, this (laughs) is a kid that ran a a 10, 400 meter dash, a sub 21, 200 meter dash in high school. He won, I believe it was all four. He won the hundred meter dash, 200 meter dash, triple jump and long jump champ state championship on the same day. Shut up. In Texas. He had one of the five fastest tw- – and, and as a senior, had one of the five fastest 200-meter dash times in the country at 20.89. <laughs> so he's a burner. I mean, he's a burner. You remember that f- that play in high school where he was he was standing still and a guy broke free and he chased him down and hawked him in like 30 yards? It was like the guy was took off from like midfield. The play was snapped like midfield. Jeez. And he hawked him like he's a true burner. He's just incredibly raw. That's the thing about Micah, incredibly raw. And so last year was all about teaching him. Now, what I was told is that the light started to go on a little bit late November, but the, he had one of the better bowl sessions that they had for the younger players. Like he was kind of like the defensive version of Charles Jagasaw. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he didn't play like Charles because there wasn't a starting job there for him to seize hold of. But from what I was told, he, he had a really good spring, or, I mean, really good uh, bowl prep. 
which gave them some confidence of like, hey, this is the kid that we saw. You know, he only played like I think like you know a couple a series or two in the bowl game. They only played 21 snaps last year, was never targeted. But what I was told is in the practices leading into the the bowl game that they felt like, uh oh, this kid's getting close. <laughs> this the, we, the, he's getting close, and so there's a lot of excitement now. Now he's got to take that next step, Vince. Right, right, and that's right. what this spring is going to be about. He, he, him, and Christian Gray are the two guys I'm probably going to have my eye on most at cornerback this spring. To be honest with you, Christian for different reasons, which we'll get into. Micah for just knowing the key for him. Micah's emergence is partly for this season, but also thinking about next year is going to be key too because. Right. They're hoping – it's kind of like the, the nickels is sort of like quarterback. They don't want to have to keep going to the portal for a nickel every year. Sure, absolutely. They'd like to develop their own. Right. And Mike is the guy that they're hoping can kind of seize hold of that next offseason or this this next season. So then when they get to next offseason, it's like, hey, we don't need to go back to the portal for a nickel unless there's like some star out there because Micah has taken that step. That's the hope. Right. And then, you know, in 2025 – the hope then is that you know Christian, Micah, and maybe Jaden are, are all starting for you mm-hmm. at that point in time. Because the the hope is that Benjamin's in the NFL. Like, let's be honest: if you're a Notre Dame coach, you're hoping that Benjamin Morrison's going pro next year. Because yeah. if he doesn't, it means he either got hurt or he didn't play very well. Right, agreed. And you don't want either one of those things to happen for him. So the hope is that he goes pro. Because if he goes pro, it means he was that dude, right? And that that we hoped he would be. And and then of course behind him you have Leonard Moore and Carson Hobbs, they're guys that we'll talk more about Vince as we get into the summer because neither will be early. Right. Goals. Yeah. So uh, Leonard Moore is a guy that I I'll just say right now I love, love Leonard Moore, love Leonard Moore. I think he's got a chance to be a really good football player. I I I had I was on the verge of making him a top hundred player, but just him not playing a bunch as a senior kept him from from getting that. Was, great was he injured? Ball. He played like half the year. He was a little banged up. Nothing okay. serious, but just didn't play as much as you'd Okay, hope. I got you. And so we didn't get to see as much <clears throat> of him as a senior. But upside Vince is, is enormous, enormous. I love this kid. He's fast. He's long. He's a legit 6'2", very long arms, great ball skills. Like he's Cam Hart with ball skills. In my okay. That's, that's his, I don't know. how. I mean, for anyone that knows how high I am on Cam Hart, for me to say that, Tells you everything you need to know about what I think Leonard Moore could be. Carson Hobbs had a breakout senior season, Vince. Uh, I had him as a three-star, three-and-a-half star, one of the second-lowest graded guy on the board, the defensive class for me. Jumped up to a four-star as a senior. Aggressive kid, physical kid, but his speed took off. He's one of the kids I said to you, Vince, this is why I just don't question Mike Mickens anymore. Because I remember (laughs) reaching out to somebody that I know, and I'm like, I don't know about this one, and – was told how much Mike Mickens loves the kid. And I was like, all right, I guess we'll see. I have to trust coach on this, but I just don't see it. And then you watch him as a senior. Because one thing that I was told was he's going to get a lot faster. I'm like, corners just don't miraculously get a lot faster between their junior and senior years. And lo and behold, he did. <laughs> he got a lot faster. And so it's just like, yep, yeah, that's why he gets paid a whole lot of money to coach corners. And I don't. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, it just, it keeps that ball rolling. You know, and the thing is, they both, in my opinion, need time. Yeah. Neither one of them are day like Car- Leonard would have a better chance of playing day one, in my opinion, than Carson. But both of them, to me, need time. So now they can come in as freshmen. You know, maybe play a little bit in backup minutes. Maybe be rotation guys. Maybe play some special teams, and then battle for a job a year from now. But I'll say this: if Leonard Moore is the player that I think he is, this time next year, if Benjamin Morrison goes pro. I will not be saying it's a lock that Christian and Jaden start a corner. That's how good I think Leonard Moore could be Wow, for Notre Dame. That's saying something. The upside is there. Yeah. So we'll see if it happens. But lots of talent coming in, Vince. I mean, the crazy thing is in past years, if we're talking about these three guys being out of rotation, they're like, we're, they're going to play a ton. Like it wasn't that long ago, these guys would have all had to play as rookies. They would have had to because they're just way more talented than anybody they have on the roster. I'm not talking like, ah, oh, you remember back when Ty Willingham was here? No, I'm talking like three years ago. Yeah, that you know wasn't I mean? that like long these ago. These guys would have had to have played a lot yeah. of football. Right. And now it's like, I don't know if these guys are going to get a chance to get on the field a whole lot. So 
it just speaks volumes of where Notre Dame is. It's different but, world. Uh, different very world. Very talented group of players. It just Mickens just keeps adding them year after year. And now he's got Cree Thomas committed in 2025. You know, they're trying to add Mark Zachary and Dallas Gold. So this cornerback thing is becoming a machine at Notre Dame under Mike Mickens. Stay. It was very wise that Notre Dame was able to keep him yeah, for another stay. year. Very, very smart. Very, very smart. So that's what's new at cornerback, Vince. That's what's new. Love it. Love it. The, the hits just keep on coming, as they say. Right? I'll, just, I'll, I'll play Casey Kasem. The hits just keep on coming. And uh, I'm excited about it. Because, look, here's the deal. Bottom line is defenses. If you want to have an elite defense, you got to have elite corners. I mean, I you, you might be able to hide one or you know whatever, but if you've got elite corners, that's a heck of a place to start for an elite defense. And Notre Dame's going to be elite at corner for a while, and that's exciting to me. And it just is so it's so weird, Vince, because. I mean, I wouldn't have been here three, four years ago. We wouldn't be talking. We wouldn't have been thinking that this was even possible. No. We would have not been sitting here thinking like, you know, um, we would not have been thinking like, hey, I think this group is going to be. We're just, we'd have been sitting there thinking like, man, I I don't, I, I don't know what they're going to do, man. This position may hold them back. Hopefully they'll be able to figure out enough and pressure enough. And exactly. We'd be talking know, about the front seven. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, Safety is, you're going to have to bail them out. And yeah. Right. You know, just like play a lot of off man, right. you know, and hope that they can't beat you deep. I mean, that's, that's where it would have been. Now you're sitting there saying like, dude, you're going to go play cover one against it. I mean, like they played Ohio state last year, which had arguably the best receiving core in the country. And Notre Dame said, we're not changing how we play. We're going to lock you down man-to-man, -man, and the outside receivers could do nothing against Notre Dame last year. Nothing. Right, right. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, look, Marvin Harrison in two games against Notre Dame's corners in two They're games hilarious. did not get to 100 yards combined. Combined, I'm not saying yes. he didn't get to 100 yards in either game. Right. I'm telling you, he didn't get to 100 yards combined in, in two, two games. games against Notre Dame. You know, so uh, he was matched up against Benjamin Morrison this year. He gave he he was targeted five times. This is the guy generational player, number one receiver in the country. Blah 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 blah. And he had five targets, two catches for twenty six yards. Benjamin had two breakups in that game. Like that's that's what he did, you know. Against uh, Scotty did against Cam in that matchup. He was zero for one against Cam, right? And so Marvin Harrison against Notre Dame's two stud corners went two for six for twenty six yards. Best receiver in college football, right? Right. Fifty six yards two years ago in twenty twenty two. I mean, that's 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 the kind of guy he is. I mean, that that's it's it's <laughs> it's exciting to think about that. But yes, it, it is. To think about, but who'd have thought we'd be here a couple years ago? That's the crazy. Oh, thing. exactly. The Absolutely. So Absolutely. It's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be a lot of fun. All right. Well, yeah. before we before we get to our next little segment, okay, we're gonna get to our five questions. But before we do, make sure you hit the like button, the subscribe button, the notification bell, you know, all the fun stuff. Tell your family and friends about it. Leave us a five star review. Do it. Get on the boards, boards.irishbreakdown.com. Somebody in the chat was asking a question that was answered on the board. So go ahead and get on the board, get the intel, get the good stuff. That way you're not like everybody else clicking the bait. Because we don't do that. We don't click the bait. Okay. So <laughs> the only clicking you need to do is boards.irishbreakdown.com. All right, Brian. Uh, I assume that this is how you do all of your uh, positional yep. breakdowns. You end up yep. with the five biggest questions at corner. And that is what we are going to jump into right now. We 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 yeah. kind of touched on some of these here and there, but we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit deeper into each one here. So the first question, Brian Driscoll, who replaces Cam Hart? Yeah. And, and and here's, here's why this is interesting, Vince, because it's not so much, it's not a question just as simply as who's going to start. Sure. Because to me, the guy that seizes hold of that job is going to influence how the coverage structure is going to look next year to the mm -hmm. field. And that's why this is a big question. I mean, it, of course, someone's going to replace him, but, when you look at Christian Gray, as I mentioned earlier, he's a six foot plus, very long arms, man, great feet, fluid, great hips. If you remember, my big question about him as a junior was I liked the film. He's very good in coverage, but I questioned the speed. And then he ran, went out and ran like a 4 4 1 at Ohio State's camp that summer, and the Buckeyes fell in love with him. LSU fell in love with him. And I was like, I didn't see that speed on junior film. 
And then he went out as a senior and you're like, there it is. And he jumped way up on my board and became I yeah. think the number two or number three kid in the class in what was one of the best defensive halls, in my opinion, Notre Dame's had in a very long time. And I mean, he's going again. And the thing is, he was going, he went against Cardinal Tate, locked him down. He went against Ryan Wingo, locked him down. He went against Aaron Scott, locked him down. Like he was going against dudes. And, and my favorite clip of Christian Gray as a senior, they were playing against Jeremiah Love's high school. And Christian was backside, and Jeremiah Love ripped off a long touchdown run. And Jeremiah's smoking it. And, and Jeremiah starts to slow down, and he looks behind him, and here comes Christian. <laughs> About to catch him, and Jeremiah then speeds back up into the end zone because it's like Christian <laughs> was funny. gaining on him. You know what I mean? And you could see the speed, but the competitiveness is something that that surprised me because Christian's a real quiet kid. He's like Benjamin; he's a very quiet kid. Sure. You know, very. And remember, we had him on the signing day show. Him and his mom, and they're like cracking jokes. He's just like awesome kid. I'm gonna tell you another story about Christian Ray that I, I want to share this too. I have a but good buddy of mine who took his son, who's autistic. Uh, to the Clemson game. He's kind of awkward with social interaction. Sure. Right? Yeah, that's that tra that tracks. And and so he's at the thing and the Notre Dame players are walking by and he sticks his hand out to get a five from a player. Now keeping the, this isn't like the player walking Notre Dame where it's like you can just reach your hand out and tap them. So like players were walking by the kid, but it was understandable because they were several feet, several feet away. Where's this at? The fans. This is at Clemson. At Clemson. Okay. Just gotcha. gotten off the bus going into the stadium. <clears throat> gotcha. Christian Gray veers off from the straight line the players are in, walks over and slaps this kid on the hand, on the hand. Just made. I mean, Vince, you know how those kind of kids responded. Like just made his day. Just oh, like yeah. the kid will never forget that the rest of his life. That's just the kind of kid he is. But he's also a heck of a football player. Mm -hmm. And we saw that last year. I mean, oh, he yeah. is the perfect fit. Like, if you could draw up the ideal corner combo in a lab for Notre Dame, it's Benjamin Morrison and Christian Gray. Absolutely. Because it gives you the chance to literally play pure man coverage on the outside, both sides. Now, if Jaden is the best guy for that spot, then Jaden is more of a man guy. He's going to play more similar to Cam coming down his because Jaden is is. I mean, we've heard people at Notre Dame say this. He's arguably the best. He's arguably the strongest player they have on the team, pound for pound. Like there's reports that he he puts up twenty plus reps on on the bench at two twenty five. Wow! Like he's a very strong player. He's a downhill, you know. Play the run, play the screen game, be physical, but you're going to have to help them over top. You're not going to be able to play cover one all day with Jaden Mickey in the game. And if you do, you're probably going to play cover one mm -hmm. like or you play play off man, you know. And and so you're going to have to play teams a lot differently when Cam, when, when he's in the game compared to when Christian's in the game. So does is he going to play that spot and he gets two thirds of the snaps and, and Christian gets one third. Is Christian going to get two thirds and Jane gets one third. Is it going to be a, yeah. A, an every other play rotation. Do you cross train Jaden to play both outside corner spots? Like do you go with a pure backup role for the field and the boundary where you've got a boundary that comes in for Benjamin, whether it's Clarence Lewis or whether it's chance Tucker, or whether it's Leonard Moore, you know, steps up early and then Jaden rotates with Cam or Christian, or does Christian be that cross train guy, or does Jaden? Because I could see this scenario, yeah. Vince, where Christian's the starter at field, Jaden comes in, backs him up, and then Christian comes off for a series, and then the next series, Christian goes to the boundary, gives Benjamin a series off. Next series after that, it's Christian and Benjamin back on the field together. Right, I could see something it's a like that. Three man rotation, right? Deal. Or it could be Jaden that plays both. You know, so it's going to be interesting to see how it shakes out because how it shakes out as far as who is the number one if one emerges. Because that's the other thing: is it one guy that primarily replaces him? Is it two? Yeah. How exactly. that gets answered is going to determine how Notre Dame has to structure their coverages this season. Right, in my opinion, because they are very Christian and Jaden are very different players. Mm -hmm. And so you can do a little bit of everything with both, but it's like I said the other day at, 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 when I saw my running back, you're going to, you're going to minor Benjamin is, or um, Jaden is going to minor in the things that Christian majors in. Yeah. That's a good and way Christian's going to gonna minor in the things that Jaden majors in. So it's not a complete brand new coverage structure. It's just 
you have both of these things in your arsenal. Right. You're just going to lean on those things a little bit more heavily when Jade's in the game. So I want people to understand this. You don't have to create a new coverage structure for Jaden. That would mean he's not very good. Right. It just means his strengths are more geared towards zone, playing downhill, being a disruptor, where Christian's strengths are more man covered. So even though I've talked about the negative aspects of Jade not being able to be like a pure man guy, that's not really what why you have to make that move. You have to make that move because you have to play to Jaden's strengths. And Jaden's strengths are going to be more in line with how you use Cam than how you use Christian. The problem is Jaden's like four inches shorter than Cam and not as long as Cam. Right. So you're you're going to have to be even more aggressive with him where Cam could kind of react late and close incredibly quickly. Jaden might get maybe triggered a little bit more with how they line him up. So that's what I mean by that, Vince, is you're, you're going to have to be smart about what you're doing when he's in the game. And not because you have to protect him, which somewhat you do, but that's more about his aggressiveness. You have to protect yeah. him because if I'm another team, I'm I'm hitting – if you're an opposing coach and you're not hitting a double move on Jaden Mickey every time you see him in the game, then you just, you're not scouting very well. And that, I'm not giving anything away. That's anyone that's watched the pit game last year is going to think that. Like the part of the reason Jaden almost had three pick sixes is because he's super aggressive once he sees something. Very, you know. Aggressive, and yeah. so you know, I'm I'm boom, hit that sluggo, and then oh, take yeah. the shot over top. The way that Notre Dame runs their coverage structure is you may get him on that, and uh oh, they're in cover one, they're in trouble, or you may get him on that. You think, but they're actually an aggressive two, and or a four. And they're rolling to that. And now you've thrown a sluggo into a safety flying over, over top. That, that's the thing is because they don't just line up pure cover one and everybody knows what's coming up. You know what I mean? Like they'll get to it in a lot of different ways. And you may, you may guess right and get them on that sluggo. And it's just big play for you props to you, but you may end up finding yourself running that sluggo into a safety that's coming, you know, that you think is middle of the field. That's now climbing over top because of the, the way that they mix up their coverage structure. So it's really about, playing to his strengths more than anything else. But sure. part of playing to his strengths is knowing we have to protect him a little bit more over the top. Yeah. That's yeah. so so that's why it's important to know who's going to be the primary replacement right. because that's going to alter how they play their coverage structure. It's fascinating. It's I mean, it, the whole thing is fascinating to me on who, you know, do the coaches want to play a certain way? Do they, you know, I mean the just the the entire dynamic is fascinating to me. And so going to be one of the things to watch there's no and doubt they're both about gonna it play right i mean that's oh absolutely we, they're yeah. both gonna play right, right. and and on honesty events mm-hmm. that kind of plays into question number three you know what i mean like a lot of this stuff that how that yeah. rotation like and, and and i probably should have put number three as number two because to build right. to it to go right into it yeah how the replacement for cam hart gets determined where they play clarence lewis does micah bell make a jump so there's a lot of these things to build but but more so primarily, the biggest thing that's going to infa- Im- impact how the staff builds around this group, which is question number three, is who emerges as the best replacement for Cam Hart. Right. Or if there's a scenario in which Christian and Jaden both have a great offseason and you're just like, dude, we're going to have to change some things because we got to find ways to use both these kids. I mean, that's mm-hmm. what good coaches have to do. So yep. it's going to be very interesting to see how that shakes out, Vince. Is there a scenario where they say, hey, we've got to find a way to get these three kids on the field together I, and, and against certain teams? That, and, that and kind of excites me, inside, by the way. Man. Right? I mean, yeah. those are all things that are going to be determined, and that's why it's a question because we don't know the answer to those things yet. Right? We we don't. And uh, um, um, if we, we won't know the entire answer by the end sure. of spring, but we'll start to get a glimpse into that, as you mentioned earlier in the show, Vince. You know, there's a faction of people that, you know, want to see the full house backfield and, you know, things like that. I want to see these three guys on the field at the same time at corner. You know what I mean? Like corner, corner, nickel or what? Like, and I'm not saying that necessarily has to be their base or anything like that, although that wouldn't be terrible. I I want to see all three of those guys on the, those are your three best corners, in my opinion, going into the spring. Those are your three best, man. Having those three on the field at the same time, man, I... Yeah. <laughs> good luck, everybody. Okay. I just I just feel really good about those three. You're not even being together. hyperbolic, Vince. That's the great thing yeah. about it. You're not yeah. really being hyperbolic about that. Yeah. 
So uh, we'll, we'll see what, what ends up happening. And like I said, it is going to be fascinating how the coaches want to use these three guys. I mean, it's an embarrassment of riches is what it is. And so, you know, it's going to be great. It really is. It really is. <laughs> And so we kind of touched on question number two. So we went one, three, now we're going back to two. We kind of touched on two a little bit when we were talking about Ben Morrison, Benjamin Morrison, uh, in, and how he stacks up against the best corners in the country. And, of course, I was fumbling for my words, and I, I said that, you know, he had a quote-unquote down year it. or whatever. We understood it. And, and you picked me up, and I appreciate that. That's what, what good teammates do. Uh, but you know, well, I, I knew what your intent was. Vince. Correct. I mean, that, that's the yeah, thing absolutely. is, it's, it's it's. I knew what your intent was, right? And and I knew the point you're trying to make because it's it's hard to explain. Yes. Because it's kind of right. like when you expect greatness, and you get really really good, it <laughs> seems like right. it wasn't as good, or it was a down year. It's like, but it's like, but it still was really really yeah. good. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And and, yeah. and it can be hard sometimes to put that into words. So I understood mm-hmm. what you're coming. Yeah. But to to your point, one of the big questions is, and and we're going to start to see this during the spring, but we really won't know the answer to this in the fall. Is this sometimes, like more often than not, Vince players just kind of get better and better every year if they're workers, if they have the talent, they just kind of get better and better sure. every year. Yep. Sometimes, however, guys just kind of show up, and this is who they are, mm-hmm. and they'll get more technically sound. They'll know the defense better, but this is who they are. And we're going to find out about Benjamin this season because it could just be this is who he is, which, again, is still one of the best corners really in college football. Yeah, right? still like, really good. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? So it's like he's still a top five corner. The question, however, is can he go from being one of the best corners to an elite, a truly elite corner? Right. Like right. a truly change the game. You're not throwing into the boundary as much as you normally do because you're just like, we can't throw at that guy. Right. And and that's where Benjamin can, and I think, and, and I don't say needs to, because I won't say he needs to do this. Because again, if Benjamin just is just the same player he was in 2022 and 2023, he's still really good. Mm-hmm. He's still one of the five to eight best corners in college football if he just repeats what he did this past season. Like right. literally right. doesn't get an ounce better. As right. long as he doesn't regress, he's one of the five to best eight corners of college football. And that's okay. Yeah. That's pretty flipping good. Right. That's all American caliber. But my thing is, I think that there's another level for him to get to, which oh, would make too. him. Yeah. And again, his ranking may not change a whole lot, but it's kind of like you can be top five, but top one or two are just in a different place all by themselves mm-hmm. right like if you look at yes. cornerback and and the nfl draft you say well these are the top five corners and anybody in the top five is pretty good but there's a big difference between number five and number one and two and that's where we need to find out if ben can get into that category to where he is a true like he's he's very good but to where just half the field is gone and he was close to that this year but a couple things he's got to do a better job of number one He's got to be more locked in against players that aren't as good as him. This is going to sound weird, but part of the reason Benjamin's numbers were the way they were last year is because he gave up yards against teams that weren't very good. Duke does not have great corners. He gave up you know, two catches for 34 yards. First play of the game, they hit him with a crazy back shoulder. Right, yeah, like right. That's one of the few exceptions uh, where it was a big game where he gave up a play. But if you look at his numbers, he gave up 79 yards against Stanford. You know, he he gave up 24 against NC State. But, like, he was really good in the biggest games last year. I mean, against Clemson, they went at him. Not, Clemson picked on Benjamin. And he gave up four catches on, on nine attempts, and only gave up 26 yards. Now, Bo Collins hit him on a great slant route to set up a touchdown. I mean, just it was, I've never seen Ben beat like that before or since. Mm-hmm. You're like, well, thank God he's now on your team, right? <laughs> but that was such a rare thing to see Ben get beat like that. Right. At times against some of the inferior teams, he'd get a little bit, eh, he's not, maybe not as locked in. That's part of being young. But the other part of it, to me, because when you look at him against the best teams in the schedule, Vince, and this is the crazy part about it, I, I talked about, you know what the what what um 
uh, Benjamin, what Mal- Marvin Harrison Jr. did against Benjamin last year, right? But it was right. it, the same thing was true against USC. We hear we we talk about you're hearing about Brendan Rice from USC getting a lot of love about how you know how good he is and he's moving up draft boards and all this kind of stuff and and how good the receiver talent is at USC against Benjamin last year. USC went at him five times gave up two completions for a grand total of three yards. Right. Right. Cause, cause locked him down. Brent, yeah, Brendan Rice that. hit beat him once. They targeted Brendan Rice four times. One time uh, he caught the ball near the end zone and about had Benjamin beat for a touchdown, but yeah. Benjamin came through and knocked it yep. out. Yep. That was a great the other play. time he beat him for that touchdown. It was on a scramble play. That was the only time. And then the Martin and then uh, Mario, uh, Mario Williams caught a pass on him for minus four yards. Right. So, I mean, it, he, he was very, very good that game. And 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 just, you know, again, lock down a guy that's about to get drafted. We talked about what he did against Ohio State. You know, Julian Fleming, one of two against Benjamin for a yard, a yard. <laughs> and, and and he had two yards after the catch. You know what that means? That means he caught a screen behind the line, gained a yard past the line, and they gave him two yards after the catch got tackled for a one yard gain. That's what that means. And then as we mentioned, Marvin Harrison had uh, five targets, two catches for 26 yards. Benjamin had two pass breakups in that game. So when you look at Benjamin, he was at his best against the best players that they played. You know, like Jamari Thrash from Louisville caught three passes for four yards on him for or three three uh three passes on four targets, 75%, but they went for a grand total of 22 yards. Like they didn't do anything on him. You know what I mean? So it's like when when no matter who they when they were playing the best teams, that's when Benjamin was 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 at his best. And yeah. and that's the sign of a guy that's a really difference a, a difference maker. Another example, Stanford. You know, they had that kid that just torched Thomas Hunter, right? And or Travis Hunter, excuse me. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. everybody talks about, you know, how good he is and, and all this stuff. And he's a very good player. But he caught one pass against Benjamin on two attempts. That's it. Like he couldn't get open against Benjamin the rest of the game. Right. And he just, he wasn't getting beat by the top guys. He answered that bell every time they played a good team. And so he was very good, but he's got to be a little bit more consistent. At times, Benjamin gets a little grabby, Mm -hmm. right? That's something like trust your technique a little bit. Exactly. He was much more grabby this year than he was last year. Now his reputation allows him to get away with that at times, but you don't want to put yourself in a situation where in the biggest game of the year, the refs decide, you know, the refs for the team that are of the conference of the team you're playing decides, well, now we're going to get them. We're, we're saving that flag for that fourth quarter, right. you know, game winning drive against you. Trust your technique a little bit more. And then the last thing, and this is really the biggest thing. If this is the only thing that gets better, if this right here is the only thing that gets better, he's got to still get stronger, which Again, true sophomore. He's 19 years old last year. Right. He's going to be a true junior now. This offseason is going to be big for him from a growth standpoint because a lot of guys make their biggest strength gains going to their junior seasons in mm-hmm. college. That's the the age that that's the that where Benjamin's getting to. Now, a lot of people are thinking, yes, he's going to be a better tackler if he gets stronger. That's true. And that's part of it. He's got to be much better against the run. But I'm talking about from a coverage standpoint. Because the only when Benjamin kind of got in trouble a couple times is when he's going against an older, stronger player. I think like, of like Bo, Bo Collins, Collins, right? I think of <laughs> yeah. Brendan Rice. Yeah, I think sure. of a 215 pound guy that's got some size on him that can kind of muscle him a little bit. When you were trying to beat him with a faster guy, game over. Like you don't right. have a chance. Yeah, exactly. And and so. Uh, think of the touch. Only touchdown he gave up against in 2022 was against Aronde Gadsden, who's technically a tight end but plays like a receiver. So that's where it'll it'll really impact him in coverage. That means at the line of scrimmage, as he's rerouting, right? So his jams would be more effective, but also just that core, that play strength yeah. throughout a route and at the catch point. Those are the areas where that strength will have an even bit. Yes, it's good that it'll be better tackler and better against the screen, and that's all fine, and he needs to get better there. But I'm more concerned about how that added strength, assuming it, he stays as fluid and stays as limber and stays as all that kind of stuff, 
Right. That added strength is going to make him a much better effect and much more effective cover player because he's going to be more physical throughout the route and even more physical at the catch point. That's saying something for a guy who's already showed his ball shown his ball skills and ability to impact the football are as good as any corner in the country. That's that's the thing, Vince. That's why I say that's where he could still get a lot better. Is just by adding straight. If he doesn't get more consistent, if he's still grabby, okay, he's still really good. Right. His playing strength improves. That's where his his game is going to take a big jump because he's going to be more physically able to hold up against some of the bigger corners that he plays. Right. Or bigger receivers. Bigger receivers. Yeah. Right. Because because Marvin the thing about Marvin Harrison is like remember Marvin beat him on a go route. But Benjamin was able to ride him out of bounds. Mm -hmm. That's an example of what I'm talking about, where Benjamin being stronger in year two than he was in year one allowed that to be a play where instead of giving up a 35-yard game, it's an incomplete pass because you you were able to force him out of bounds. Some of the other receivers were – I mean, to be honest with you, Marvin didn't play that route very well. Right. Because Benjamin beat him at the line. And Benjamin kind of whooped him that game. But against a more physical receiver, he might get beat a little bit. The, the the kid from Duke, who's not that big, to beat him on the jump ball in that game. That's a senior kid. That's a very strong, muscular kid who's outplayed Benjamin for the ball. Mm-hmm. Those are the areas where Benjamin's game could take a jump. That's why I say I don't think he has – I think he is who he is as an athlete. I don't think Benjamin's going to all of a sudden run a 4-3. He's not going to grow two inches. He's not going to – you know, like his technique's not going to get a ton better because it's already pretty good. That area right there, that play strength that comes through rate, rate, weight room work and all that, that's where his game could take a big jump, Vince, right. and, and allow him to be even more productive throughout routes and at the catch point. And that's why I think if that area can improve, that's how Benjamin goes from being really, really good to a true to half elite, the field elite, gone, elite, elite yeah. type of cover player in college. Yep, and he's got all the ability to do it. It just would love to see it happen. Would love to see that jump in year three because, I mean, as much as I would love it to happen, probably not going to get a year four out of Benjamin Morris. So. I don't want to see a year four from Benjamin. Right. Like, no, I agree with you because like, you brought I, that up before. Yeah, yeah, I want Benjamin gone after this year, not because of, for any reason. Like, I want to see what this guy can do. No, because – that's good for Notre Dame and it's good for Absolutely. Benjamin. Absolutely. Yeah. If Benjamin leaves after this year, it means he's a first round pick. It means he was healthy. It means he played elite football and he's going to be a first round pick. That's good for Benjamin. That's good for Notre Dame. Like, that's why I say, like, I don't want him back next year because the way he's played, in my opinion, the only, I could be wrong on this. I'm not a draft expert. I'm just giving you my opinion. The only way Benjamin comes back in 2025 is really one of three reasons. One, he gets hurt. Yeah, don't want that. Two, he he doesn't have a very good year. Don't want that either. Nope. Or three, for some reason he thinks Notre Dame's this close to winning a championship, and he and wants, wants to be to part get, of that. Wants to roll with it, and yeah. and and decides to come back. But honestly, if I'm Marcus Freeman, I love right. the kid, <laughs> dude. But if you're a first round, you got to go look out for yeah. you now. Yeah. He may still decide. I mean, his you know <clears throat> his, his dad's a former NFL player. He may say, "Look, son, you only get one chance at this." You right. understand it. That's fine. We've seen that. We've seen Notre Dame players do that before. Manti did that. Tyler Eifert did that. But my whole thing is if Benjamin's as good as I think he can be, it's all he's he's that kind of kid like what Notre Dame did. And, and what here's what I, I was told this, and I, I don't know how true this is, but I was told this by a couple sources that that Quinton actually and Nelson actually expressed some thoughts of, hey, I'm not sure what I'm going to do after 27. Like after the season was over, Quinton had some like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. This is what I was told. This may have been before the bowl game. Okay. Mean, I don't know when it happened, but like when it came down to decision time, he was kind of having a, I'm not sure if I should stay or go thoughts. And I was told that everybody at Notre Dame was like, dude, you got to go. Like we love the sentiment of you wanting to come back, but you're ready. Right. Cause there comes a point in time as a coach that once the season's over with, you've got to do your job of looking at what's best for your players. For sure. And not trying to, you know, do what Kelly did with Stefan to it and try to give him half information to try to convince him to come back. You got to do what's best for your players. And it, so I hope Benjamin's not back next year. You're right. And it's going to sound crazy, but that means that Benjamin's healthy and has become the version of himself that we think he's capable of getting to. He's already very good. Right. But Benjamin, the last couple of years, has been a, a day two guy. Mm-hmm. Right. Like maybe early day two, but he has a chance to be a 
day one guy, an early day one guy, that play strength to me is the big difference. If that takes the jump, as long as he's healthy, then there's a he's a no-brainer first-round pick in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Because we've already seen him go against first – we've already seen him go against dudes. And so, I mean, that's the thing about Benjamin is you, you look at who he's gone against his first two years. He's gone against, I mean, Ohio State two years in a row. He's gone against the guys at North Carolina last year who are really good players. I mean, he has been, you know, North Carolina with Drake May, the first round draft pick, completed one pass on two attempts for six yards against Benjamin last year. You know what I mean? Like, uh, he he's a he's just been a dude his entire career. And, I mean, USC with Caleb Williams, you remember that one, they just completely avoided him the entire game. Completely avoided once. him. Like he didn't An exist. Incomplete pass. Yeah. yeah. And right. he almost, if I remember correctly, they, they went deep on him once and he almost picked it. I think that's you remember accurate. that? Like they, yeah. they, it was a go route. They went at him once early in the game. He almost picks it off and Caleb was like, screw that. I'm not throwing at that guy again. He's gone against CJ Stroud. He's gone against Caleb Williams. He's gone against Drake May. So in his two years in our name, he will have gone against three top five draft picks at quarterback. That doesn't include Jaron Hall. That doesn't include other guys that were that were you know Tanner McKee got drafted I believe Jaron Hall started a game in the NFL this year, like he's gone against dudes. This is he's gone against high picks that you know Josh Downs was a high pick at receiver last year. He didn't go against him a ton, but like he's gone against some dudes, and you know he's been able to hold his own. So he's not like dominating because they play Army Navy every week. Right, right. right. That's that's my point. So he's got a chance to be a true star, but. We got to find out because I'll wrap it up with this. Man. I got very long winded on this. I apologize, but here's the okay. point. Benjamin Morrison playing just the way he was again this year is a, an all American caliber player, but you're not necessarily going to be afraid of him. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Benjamin taking that next step makes you afraid to throw at him. And the reason that matters is because the reason that Cam was able to avoid him or Caleb was able to avoid him is because they didn't have Cam and Tariq Bracey in that game, remember? So, yeah, yep. you it was easier to avoid him. It's going to be harder to avoid him if Christian Gray and Jordan Clark and Xavier Watts and Jay, you know what I mean? Like, So if he's as good as he we think he can be and he takes that jump, the impact is he genuinely shuts down half the field. What a shutdown corner to me isn't a guy that holds teams to a low percentage rate and all that. It's a guy that literally you just stop throwing to. Right. Like that. that's the difference. And that opens up so many things for other positions. And it changes how you call a game. When you're a cornerback that changes how teams call a game, that's a true elite game changer. Not a guy that just shuts this guy down and wins this battle, but says we're not even going to fight that fight. That's that's like as a as a former offensive corner. If I had a corner back that was that good, that's not. I didn't want to be there because it's like it changes how you call the game. Oh yeah. And eventually you're going to figure out my. You're going to figure out that I'm afraid to go here or I'm I'm unwilling to go here, and then that's going to impact a lot of the other decisions you're going to that that you're going to make and how you call the game that plays into your favor against me. Yeah, defense. And that's why it's important yeah. that Benjamin take that step because even if he doesn't. If he just repeats this past year, they got one of the five to six best corners in all of college football next year. But they got a chance to have the best corner or the second best corner in all of college football next year that truly takes over games. And that's why it's a question of whether or not he'll make a jump. It's it's that's what we're arguing, Vince. We're not arguing, oh, is right. Benjamin any good or is he overrated? No, none of that. None of that. It's is he gonna be really, really good or game changing? That's right. the difference. That's the right. conversation. Again, very, very, very high floor. Right? Very high floor right. is what we're talking about. But what's the ceiling? That's that's the biggest question. What is the ceiling? Where is he right. going to hit? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Question number four, though, Brian, is another one that we kind of touched on because we touched on – the question is, does Michael Bell become a factor? And that's a huge question because of – is he a factor at the nickel? Is he, you know, if he can be the number two at nickel, like you had mentioned earlier, that means now, okay, you can move Clarence Lewis to be a backup safety or a star, you know, whatever the case may be. It allows you to move the chess pieces a little bit different. If Micah Bell can step up and be that number two guy, number one for 24, and then in the future, 
taking over that spot at nickel because again, Notre Dame needs to have some homegrown nickels. They they've gone to the portal for nickels the last few years. They have to. a home. I mean, they, yeah. exactly. They've absolutely had to. So if you can now, okay, now you start home growing them. Okay, now you don't have to go to the portal for that anymore. Just like okay, we don't have to go to the portal for quarterback anymore. We got the room. You don't have to go to the portal for nickel anymore. We got the room. Like that's that's where you want to be. And then you use the nickel to fill some hole. Or I mean, you use the portal to fill some holes. But now you're where you want to be from a depth standpoint. And that's, you know, a lot of that in 24 is riding on will Micah Bell as a redshirt freshman be able to take that step and become a factor in this defense. For Micah, the physical tools are there, Vince. I mean, he's right. a strong kid for his size. He's incredibly fast, exceptionally fast. You know, he's, he's a competitive kid in, in every capacity. It's just, can he pick up the technique and he's, does he have the natural feel for playing in coverage? That's the right. question. And if he does, then he's going to be really, really good. Mm-hmm. And so what that does then is that means you can limit the way that you can limit the reps on Jordan Clark. So he stays fresh. It gives you a pure cover guy that allows you certain matchup advantages when you play teams that are, you know, maybe a little bit more athletic on the perimeter. Mm-hmm. It especially Vince when you get to the postseason and you're playing the Georgias and I'm you know there's right. the Ohio States and some of these yeah. other teams where it's like like last year like they just started putting a Mechic Buka on you know Thomas Harper and they they could get some third and fourth down matchups that they liked. You put a guy that can run a 4-3 on there, and then maybe that limits some of those things a little bit, right? Sure. I mean, as good as Tariq Bracey was, he ran a mid 4-5, which I was actually surprised by. I thought he'd be a I thought he'd be a high 4-4 guy. But he, think about how and he impacted the game with his speed. Imagine you talk about a guy that's in a 4 threes. Mm-hmm. Right. And and so Micah gives you pure cover potential as a nickel. And think about a guy with his speed coming off the edge on a blitz, because they will blitz that nickel. Think about that 4-3 speed coming off the edge, using that speed to blow up screen games and things like that. If Micah Bell, if the light goes on for Micah Bell, his speed is truly game-changing. It is. I mean, it just changes everything. You can use Jordan Clark, maybe some at safety, if there's some issues there. But even just having a normal rotation where Jordan's still your starter, sure. but Micah's given you some, some good reps there and – Gives you some games you can match up, but then going into 2025, you're talking about like, good, we're, we're going to have one of the best nickel situations in the country with this kid now that he's going into year three. Right. So, but, but you need the thing, the reason this is a question, Vince, because if he doesn't like make any kind of push this year, then you have to wonder, is he just a track kid that doesn't know how to play football? Like, that's the thing. I'm not saying he has to be a starter this year, right? But he, he at least needs to be like a guy that's, that's turning heads, say, hey, we got to figure something out with this kid. We got to find a way to get this kid on the field some way, somehow. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. No, I, you can't. That's the key. It would be a, it would be an absolute shame and you can place blame wherever you want it, but it would be it to me, it would be an absolute shame if they don't find a way to get Micah Bell on the field. Yeah. And, well, I, and, I and that place, could be, yeah, I, I would say I, I, I place blame. Cause I mean, he just may not be good enough. It would be disappointing if it's, you know what I mean? Like, cause like thing is Mike, Mike Mickens has shown, I'll play a freshman. I'll play a sophomore. I mean, it won't be about youth. I'll play a rotation. It, sure. It'd be different if we were still talking in the Kelly era where they just they don't play depth. Right. And they don't play young guys. They're just, they're just, this is their starters. If he's not ready to, and you've got one of the best cornerback coaches in all of college football at the if he's not ready to play, it just tells me he doesn't have the feel for the game yet. Right. And that right. would be disappointing. So well, and again, that, yeah, and that's what I was referring to. Not yeah. not will they play him if he was ready and they're just not gonna play him. Like that's that's not what I meant. I meant like. Either he's not getting coached up, however you want to say it, or he's not taking the coaching, isn't ready, you know, whatever the case may be. If he's not on the field, that would disappoint me. Like I, I feel like he's got the tools, but you gotta, you know, you gotta coach him up. You gotta coach him up. But he also also has to take the coaching and get there himself as well. I mean, it's a it's a two way street is is I guess the point that I was making and. And I, I saying place the blame maybe isn't the, the right terminology to I use, but like it's either the coaching or the player or both or none of the above. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, just you just yeah. may not have it. But if exactly. he does, if he does start to push though, Vince, you yeah. start to get real excited about yeah. okay, because like we just got done talking about a guy that we think could be an elite game changer at cornerback. 
Right. Exactly. It's going. Right. I mean, as much as I love Cam Hart, if Benjamin Morrison reaches his peak this year, it's going to be a lot harder to replace him as the boundary corner. Sure. Than it will be Cam Hart. It'd be real nice to be in a situation where you're like, Christian Gray's as good as he is. We think he can be. And Mike is as good as we think he can be. And sure. Jaden as good as we think he can be. Because then it's not so much a any of you has to replace Benjamin by yourself, but as a trio, maybe right. Leonard Moore steps up and he pushes that kind of thing. As a group, you can be better as a group, even though no one's as good as that guy individually. That That's kind of where you're at. But if all right. of a sudden right. Right. you've got to replace Benjamin and you've now got to go to the portal again for another nickel because the light doesn't go on for Micah, now I get a lot more nervous about the cornerback position next year than I am this year. And that leads us to question number five. Absolutely. And question number five, can Notre Dame actually be better at corner in 24? And that question blows my mind because they were really good in yeah. 24 or 23. But is, it, really is good. it a fair question? It's an absolutely, it's a fair right. question. It's an absolute fair question. Now, I, I'm not ready to say they will be better because that Correct. there's a lot to happen Correct. between now and the start of yeah. the season. Okay, and I just, love what they had last year. You don't replace Cam Hart and say you're right. better without seeing anybody play a snap, yeah. right? I mean, that you know right. what I mean. Exactly. Like, that would be exactly. starting to get disrespectful to Cam Hart. Correct, that and that, that is not the route I'm going. Right, so and you wouldn't either. Well, I'll say but, this, Vince. What I have said, so people are clear. I have said I expect the secondary to be better next year. That's a fair. This statement. question is more about will the cornerback position alone outside field boundary, right? Will that be better than it was a year ago? That's different right. than the whole secondary being better. And the, so this, so just so we're because I have said I fully expect the secondary to be. Better. I do too. No, I do too. I do right. too. And that's and that's more of a that's more of us talking about the safety position than it is talking about the corner position. So it's and as a whole, you know, in the in the defensive secondary. But the fact that we're even asking this question at number five tells you what we think about the depth in the cornerback room in 24, because it was really good in 23. And to say that there's a chance that they could be better, that's nuts. I mean, you would say yeah. that that's nuts, but there is, the, I mean, it's a legitimate question because of the depth. It's still a question, as you said. It, it is. It is. Absolutely it is. It's not one that we can answer right now. Yeah. Because if we were sitting there, like when I did the receiver breakdowns, the receiver's going to be better this year. Full stop. Yeah, like, it's not going out on a limb on that one. Really, it's not a question. Is <laughs> they're going to be better? <laughs> right. The question is how much better. Sure. You know, though th I the D line will be better this year, in my opinion. I I'm not really. It, the question is how much? A little bit? A lot? What? Somewhere in between? That yeah. that's what we don't know. Right. For here, it's a genuine question because they may not be as good as they were this past year cornerback. I, right. My thing is, they're still going to be good. You, when you have Benj, it's like safety. They were not great at safety this year. They were good. They were good because they had an elite guy and then just some do your some guys. job guys. Some guys. Yeah. Right. Right. So as a group, they were good. Cornerback to me is going to be good, even if if Benjamin's just here's the thing. If Benjamin's just stays the same. They're going to be good at corner. Mm -hmm. May not be as good as last year, but still pretty good. Because if Christian and Jaden aren't as good as Cam, there's things you can do coverage wise to help protect them a little bit. And we know they're at least, you know, we know the floor of what they could be if just what they did this year, right? So that's the thing is if they did what they did this year and don't get an ounce better, just a little bit stronger in a weight room for Christian, right. that's still a very a pretty good cornerback. That's still one of the ten best cornerback rooms in all of college football. And this is the crazy thing about this, Vince. <laughs> like they were a top three to four cornerback room last year. They're at the very least going to be top like second half of the top 10 this year. If, if everybody in 24 just repeats what they did in 23, right? This is going to be a top 10 cornerback room in college football. And that's with the subtraction of cam Hart. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like right. if Benjamin Christian and Jaden all just repeat their 2023 seasons, they don't get an ounce better. Right. Just a you know little bit weight room stronger. That's it. Right. Then they're they're still going to be a, a a pretty good corner room. The question I have is, can they be better? Can they have mm -hmm. the best cornerback room in college football next year? And and then of course, so if if eight to ten is the floor, and one is the ceiling, where do they fall in that range? That's right. that's the question for me. 
the key to it all is twofold. One, and this is the big key. The big key to me is Christian Gray. Mm-hmm. With I love Jaden Mickey. Great kid. But like Jaden's just not as the ceiling is not as high with Jaden as it is. I agree. Christian. I it agree. And and if, if Christian if Jaden Mickey is your super sub, you're much better off mm-hmm. than if he's your starter, in my opinion. Now he may not like to hear that. And I understand that. I don't want him to like to hear it, by the way. (laughs) Exactly. I don't want him to like that. Yeah, right. But he's going to be a very important piece to this. Sure. But Christian Gray is the key to me. Because I think Christian Gray can be every bit as good as Benjamin Morrison. Like, not not this year. I'm saying on the career path. Right. Right? So, like, you know, Benjamin's a year ahead. So, like, could Christian Gray be as good in 2024 as Benjamin was in 2023? Yes. That's what I'm saying. Right? So if he gets anywhere close to that, which I think he can, then all of a sudden you're talking about having a truly elite game-changing cornerback room that you sure. can just literally line up on the outside. I'm watching the Super Bowl events, and you know I watch playoff football. I don't watch the regular season. I, I watch the playoffs this year, and I'm, I'm watching the 49ers, and you're just like, they're so handicapped because Kansas City can just lock them down on the outside. And, and they've got to try to figure out ways to make plays with their outside guys just completely taken out of the game. And you watched Ohio State struggle against Notre Dame the whole game that way. They had to manufacture yards and plays right. in the slot. Now, a couple guys didn't make plays they should have made. That was the difference in the game. But at the end of the day, if the Notre Dame offense is competent, that's a loss for Ohio State because Notre Dame could just, against first-round draft picks, just lock them down and say yep. – you're not and not by coverage scheme by just cam's better than your guy benjamin's better than your guy or at least we're as good as you here i mean they they did not give help to benjamin morrison against marvin harrison jr gave him no help it was benjamin Mm -hmm. have at it yeah and he he won the battle and it worked out pretty well right they did the same thing against usc won the battle and so it's if you can do that on both sides, like that changes the entire because it doesn't just impact your corners, Vince. It impacts how you use your safeties. It impacts how your how you use your nickel. It impacts how because if you have if you have to play more zone, then your nickel has to play more zone, which means you're going to give up more slants. You're going to have more like cheap routes. You're going to give up some you know some some shorter throws. If you're able to just lock down and say, we're going to play man, and then we're, our safeties are going to help the nickel, you're locking people down. But that also allows you to trigger Jordan Clark more on runs, run stunts and blitzes. Because you can – I mean, think about this. How many teams, if Christian Gray is the player we think he can be, can lock you down on the outside with Gray and Morrison and then bring Benja- and bring Xavier Watts down to play, to play man, post-snap man on your slot with a guy like Jordan Clark or Micah Bell coming off the edge in a run stun or a blitz? Right. Like it just gives you so many more options to attack teams inside. If you could just line up and say, Christian, you got that dude, Benjamin, you got that dude, go win. Right. It just, it changes the entire complexity of your defense, Vince. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's important. Yep. And so if Christian makes the jump, to me, he's the key. And then number two is Jordan Clark and Micah Bell in the slot have to be able to at least at the very minimum continue what you got the last two years. Right. Which I think they will. Mm-hmm. I mean, it would require Jordan Clark regressing to not do that. And I don't see that happening. And then if Micah Bell steps up to where now Jordan doesn't have to play every single snap in the slot, because the slot can be a very tiresome position. Oh my gosh. Yeah. If you don't have some breathers, because you're just chasing all, yeah, all day. day long. Cause that's the guy you're putting in motion most of the right. time. And it, right. it's, it's, and he has a lot quick. more run blocking, yeah. block destruction response. Sure. That is a much more tiresome position, in my oh, yeah. opinion, than playing outside corner. If you have a guy like Micah Bell that can spell Jordan Clark, Right. Three, that's, four that's series huge. a game. Yeah. That's huge. And so as long as those two things happen, then that's what need that's what needs to happen for them to become even better Crazy. than they were last year. Crazy, but it's uh, a legitimate it's possible, question. but yeah. I gotta see it first. Yeah, absolutely. But honestly, and- Vince, I have a weird confidence that Christian Gray is gonna be a breakout player for Notre Dame this year. I loved watching him when he was in the yeah. game last year. He's just smooth. 
He looks, obviously, we talked about this, right? He looks like Benjamin Morrison. You can't tell him apart from the ninth floor at Notre Dame Stadium. You can't, right? If they happen to put on the same number, I'd have a really hard time to tell them apart, okay? Yeah. Because they just they just move so similarly. I mean, yeah. I looked at the, I looked at the uh, at the roster while we were talking about it earlier. They're both listed at six foot. One's listed at one eighty five. One's listed at one eighty three. There's a two <laughs> pound difference, okay? Like, and I I would venture to guess that their wingspan is very similar. Like, it, it, they're just very similar players from a physical standpoint and the way they play is very similar and to have that as bookends on your yeah. defense. Like that is the ideal scenario. Well, right? and I'm then starting you. looking into next year events too, is if Christian is as good as we hope, if what we're talking about happens now, then when Benjamin goes pro and becomes a first round draft pick, you're just sliding Christian over into the boundary. Correct. And now, then, boom, you're still rolling. Absolutely. Replacing absolutely. Rolling. Absolutely. He, here's the last question, Vince, that I have that we didn't think that we didn't bring up that we have. We're just going to address it quickly. The only coaching question I have is, Will Mike Mickens now having all the secondary impact how the corners are prepared? I don't think it will, but it's at but it's least something question. we have to keep an it's, eye on. It's still a legitimate question because you just doubled his workload as a coach. I mean, now he's got to worry about four positions instead of two. Well, I guess he was he was in charge of the nickel too. So he's in charge That's... of five positions instead of three. Okay, so you upped it 40%. But that's still legitimate. And, and now, again, I agree with you. I think that Mike Mickens is going to be just fine. I think the secondary agree. is going to be just fine. But it's still an unanswered question Correct. that we're going to be keeping an eye on because it's just different. It's, it's just different. And so I agree with you. I, I think they're going to be. I think they're going to be just fine. And the, the safety position, I think, is going to take a jump. And it would have taken a jump with Chris O'Leary as the coach too. Okay, I do want to say that. I, I do feel that way. But now Mike Mickens is going to be able to put his stamp on the safeties, and I do feel pretty good about that too. But yep. it's still an unanswered question. Still an unanswered question that we're going to get a glimpse into in the spring. So, yeah, yes. it's going to be fun. Gonna it's be going to be fun. All right, so that's going to do it for our five questions, Brian. And in yeah. the meantime, make sure, look, we got people in here. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. Jump on the boards on irishbreakdown.com. That's where the intel is. That's where the good stuff is. We know Ryan is down at the Combine. He's going to be putting stuff out about what he sees down there from the Notre Dame players, et cetera. So get, get on the boards, folks. I'm telling you, it's my, it is my everyday activity to jump on the boards and see what's going on. What's the conversation? What is happening? I'm telling you, that's where it's at. So jump on there, boards at irishbreakdown.com. Give us a review. Five stars. That'd be fun, too. All right, Brian Driscoll, are you ready for rapid fire? Is that where we're at? Is that where we're at right now? You are, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, best part of the show. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, best part no, of rapid, it is best part of I, mean, I love this part. Yeah. 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 This is where we're dive. This is where we make the transition from the big show to the Ibination Sports Talk part of the show. So I'm excited about it. So rapid fire, Brian. Here we go. First question, leadoff hitter. Obviously, I just brought it up at the end of the last show. The combine is in full swing right now. It's going to be going all week. The Notre Dame player with the chance to make the biggest move is blank. I, I think it's Audric Estime. Okay. Because I, I think a lot of other guys are going to make climbs. I think that obviously Joe Walt has a chance to cement his status as the top tackle. You've got Cam Hart's got a chance to – because like I think for Cam, it's not so much about him rising – it's if he answers the medicals this week and yes, tests well, it's about thing, him yeah. locking himself kind of into that day two, late day two kind of range. You know, Javante Jean Baptiste can like and lock himself into a legit day three pick. For me, I think Audric has a chance. And and I know some people say, like, you know, testing doesn't matter, but we see this happen every year. It shouldn't right. matter, but right. every year we see guys test well and it impacts their draft status every year i think audrick's a guy that pe people are loving his film in the nfl and he's a great runner great feet all these type of things but the question that you have is projecting him to the next level is does he have the explosiveness and the burst sure. to kind of be that kind of neck that next level guy it and so if audrick can show the speed because I, I do think the 40 
People say this all the time. 40 doesn't matter. Yes, it does. We see scouts and teams. I think scouts probably it matters less to them than it does decision makers. I think decision makers tend to fall for this kind of stuff all the time. That's just, we see it all the time. Uh, if Audra can run a, a surprising 40 time and then test well in the agilities, mm-hmm. I think he could he could have skyrocket to be in the number one back in this draft class. Wow. I do. Wow. I do. Where, where's he at no, right now? There's no uh, top three like or middle. four. Okay. Top okay. three or four. I mean, okay. like there's no Jameer Gibbs in this draft class. Sure. You know what I mean? There's no Derrick Henry in this draft. class. There's no surefire number one first round guy. I think he's got a chance because he – like the some of the other guys that are in that contention are, are not necessarily like for sure bell cows. Gotcha. If Audric shows the explosiveness and then catches the ball well, all those type of things, I think he could be that kind of guy. Somebody said, "What was Kyron's forty time? It was four five eight? But that's the whole point. Kyron was a fifth round draft pick. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like we're talking about boosting up. The, if Kyron would have ran a four four, he'd have got drafted much higher than the fifth round, right. most likely. Right. And if Audric goes in the fifth round, that's a disappointment. Like that big time. That's a disappointment. Yeah. Right. So so how does he run? And right. how does he move in agilities? How does he catch the ball in drills? I think Audric has a chance to to go from third or fourth running back on the board, which is probably late day two. Yeah, to number one guy off the board, which could skyrocket him all the number top of the second round, middle second. That's millions of dollars in difference. Oh yeah, oh, which yeah. is why I think he has the most to gain. That's me. That's that's who I see. No, and that 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 was the direction I was going to head too. So just to be devil's advocate, I am going to go with my guy, Cam Hart. I and, and the re, and the reason I say that, and I agree with everything that you said, it's the medicals and and what Cam Hart has. And I am not I'm not a draft expert by any stretch of the imagination. But here's what I do know about Cam Hart. His measurables will make decision makers get excited. He's got the measurables of an NFL corner, right? And I think he's going to test well. I, I think he's going to test really well. And so the big question mark is the medicals. And it's so it's almost like this question should be who's going to test well to make them go up and all that. I think he just has to have good medicals. And I think he could jump up some people's draft boards from where they might have them at the moment. Yeah, that's so, interesting take. I just I with Cam, I kind of feel like people already know he's fast. They already know he moves well. Yeah. I, I think right. I don't think they're gonna be surprised just, by any of that. Yeah. I think where his is he stays in that day two range or he falls because of the medicals. Okay. I don't know if there's a scenario in which Cam goes from like like I don't think people are thinking he's gonna run in the mid four fives and then he runs in the four fours and they're shocked. Right. Like, I mean, there's enough GPS dad on him to know like this. I mean, he was in F- Feldman's freaks list. You know what I mean? Like people oh, yeah. know this kid's a freaky athlete. Yeah. 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 It's Kenny stay healthy. Right. And I don't know if there's anything, the, the questions about camera, the, the medicals and then the ball skills. And I don't know if there's anything that the, the comic can do. I think for him, it's about don't fall back. Okay. Keep the momentum going that you have. Now, I hope you're right because I would love to see Cam skyrocket up draft I, boards because it's good for him and it also helps Notre Dame that they can oh, like, sure. finally have a corner get taken really high. Yeah. Like, yeah, if he sure. if he can like jump into the round two, that'd be I don't see it happening. But if it does, that'd be phenomenal. Oh, be great. Be great I, for him and great for Notre Dame. Let's put it this way. Wherever he ends up, if it's outside round two, okay. So if it's outside round two, he's gonna be a steal for somebody. That's that's how I that's how I see it. I think he's a round two guy. He should be like, I think he'll end up as, as, you know, we always do redrafts and all that, you know, and you look back and I think if we look back in five years from now, he's a, he's a, he's if a he round healthy. two guy. If he stays if healthy, he can stay healthy, hundred percent. But mm-hmm. I think he's a, he's a round two guy. And so if he goes anywhere after round two, I think that he's going to be an absolute steal. I I'm, I am really excited to watch him in the NFL. I think he's going to, he's going to be awesome. That's going to be so much fun. All right. Question number two. Kind of another uh, combine question. The fact that Javante Jean-Baptiste was up all night with food poisoning, literally throwing up until 10 o'clock this morning, and still tested well at the combine is blank. Not surprising for anyone <laughs> that knows this kid. I mean, he's just going to give you everything he's got. Yeah, I, I mean, it. he did it all year at Notre Dame. He, you know, he talked about how he lost 20 pounds after the bowl game because he had a sickness and then still shows up at the senior bowl. Doesn't doesn't have a particularly good week at the senior bowl because he was down 20 pounds and, yeah, you know, that and means all something. that. But you just it that's what teams are gonna love, right? I mean, they're, yeah. they're this kid, this kid's gonna battle, he's gonna show up every day. He's gonna there's gonna be no excuse, no big time, and I'm I'm gonna compete. And 
anybody that watched him play this year knows this is a kid that's going to give you everything he's got. I mean, that that's whether he played well or played poorly. You, you, him and Nana were both this way, but we're talking about Javante. There was never a game you look back and were like, he didn't bring it today. Yeah, yeah. Javante didn't bring it today. That was right. never – there was a chance he didn't play necessarily really well, right? In other games he played even better. But, you know, it just – yeah. That's yeah, no. Up. I, it, it is not surprising at all because, look, he continues to prove people wrong since the second he stepped on campus at Notre Dame, right? I mean, when he when we heard that he was going to be in the trans, you know, that he was coming to Notre Dame out of the transfer portal and all these different things, it's like, okay, you know, depth guy, depth piece, great, okay, whatever. And he's a guy that I am sad to see go, you know, based on the way he played. And you said, you talked about his motor in a game and how he was from, from, you know, whistle to whistle to the echo of the whistle, you know, all the cliches, like that is who he was. And he played himself into an extremely important piece of a really good defense at Notre Dame. And he just continues to prove people wrong. And I love it because there's plenty of people out there who would have maybe even declined the senior bowl because he wasn't at the physical peak where he needed to be. There's plenty of people that, He's puking the day of all of his testing would have been like, yeah, it's not going to happen. And you would have, I mean, yeah. it would have been like, okay, I get it. You were sick. Like, I get it. But he just continues to show yeah. up. And and, show I mean, he out, needed man. to, right? I mean, yeah. th- with where he is on the draft boards, he needs to be that guy that does that, right? But right. he also took a great risk because if he goes out That's there and runs a four, seven something and, and does, I mean, but he ran out, had one of the five or six best 40 times of an edge. He had a great broad jump. He had a 34 yeah, he average did. vertical. You know, I mean, he 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 was sick, but not, now he was sick. He actually overperformed a little bit. Ryan had him projected to run like a low four seven, and have a a nine ten broad. He ran a he had a ten five or a ten seven broad and a four six six unofficial. So, uh, you know that that, that's um, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, and yeah, you know, and if he doesn't like those numbers, which I don't know why he wouldn't, he could have another opportunity in sure. Notre Dame's pro ga- pro day. I mean, yeah. he, he look, he could have very easily been like, look. I was just puking my guts out. I'll see you at Notre Dame's pro day. I can run a low four six or something. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like he, but now he doesn't have that. to. I mean, exactly. now he can just do position drills and yeah. all that. He doesn't yeah. necessarily have to test again, or he could no. just put, focus all his attention on running a forty. Right, because he right. likes to do the other stuff. So absolutely yeah. happy yeah. for him. No, me too. For him. No, me too. All right, here's a kind of a football slash question. So with the new twelve team playoff starting this year, buy or sell the college football playoff. Or March Madness, which meaning like it being better? Like than, which, I mean, which one would you rather like watch? I guess I'm, you know? I'm selling. I'm totally selling the notion that the college football playoff is going to become like March Madness. Okay. It'll be popular. It'll make a lot of money because it's college football. But the whole aspect of March Madness is it just flows, man. You have games on like the first weekend. You have yeah. games on four days, and then the next yeah. weekend you have games on four days, and then it's you know, then you've got the sweet 16 and elite eight games and then the final four. And it just, it's bam, 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 bam. It's There's going to be like 12 games between this game and 11 day games. Between yeah. like the first round happens on the, the 20th and the 20th, 19th and the 20th, something like that, or 20th yeah. and 21st. I think 20th and 21st. Yeah. And then the next round's like not to like New Year's Eve. Right. And it's just like, it's so you know, it's, spread it's out. It's going to be hard to have the same kind of momentum. Yeah. It'll still be popular, but it won't be the event. There you go. That March Madness is. I like that. In my opinion. Yeah. No, I like that. I I think March Madness is is still going to be like the thing because everybody gets involved with March Madness, right? I mean, everybody's filling out brackets. Like literally everybody is filling out brackets and, you know, cares about what the, the outcomes of these games are, taking off work to, you know, watch these games and do all these different things. I have three monitors at my desk at work, and one of those mm-hmm. monitors will be dedicated to watching college basketball during March Madness. Like I, I do think college football could be that if they would could come close to that if they would go set Friday, Saturday, round one, and then Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. Right, just boom, boom, boom. But even then, in a 12-team playoff, that's four rounds. That's four weeks. Yeah. College basketball right. is what? It's four weeks, but it's not as huge in the in the second right. two weeks as it is in the but you're first. You're playing two six weeks. games, yeah, right. in four weeks, right? You know, so you're playing two the first weekend, two the next weekend. Actually, it's only three weeks, right? 
Oh yeah, you're right. It is three it's weeks. Only three Gosh. weeks. It's the Helps first like two ad. rounds. Yeah. Then a Sweet then Sixteen, sweet Elite 16. Eight. And then, and then final, final four, four. champs. So in three so weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, you're so right. So it's tw- it's six games in three weeks compared to four games in four weeks. Right. So it's just it's just it's a lot more. And if here's the thing too. Let's be honest. There won't be the upsets in 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 college football that there is. In, I mean, part of the Agreed. fun of the March Madness is a team like Butler comes out of nowhere and plays for the championship two years in a row. George Mason, Loyal, Loyal yeah, Chicago. Right. 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 You know, you're just not going to see though. I mean, you're you're going to see upsets, but it won't be like the 12 seed wins the title. Well, I don't it'll, think it'll be. And I and in my opinion, it'll be that first weekend. You might see a couple upsets, right? But then from then on, first two, because there's going to be some teams and that are get buys that aren't elite. Teams. That's that, that's that's but, true. But the point is, but it but yeah. even like a, a nine seed is still a really good freaking team. Like yeah, like an an, an sure. eight seed. In college football, right, the eight eight seeded team is a two seed in the college NCAA tournament, right? Right. If you're the twelve seed, you're a three seed in the NCAA tournament, right? Right. And so the point is, like, those aren't real upsets. Right. Those are the twelve best teams. There's there's not going to be a. And the only way that happens is if like the group of five team makes a run. Right. And I just don't see that happening. I don't either. Uh, even those really good Cincinnati teams aren't doing that. Even those UCF teams, they might have won round one. Sure, but then the next round they're probably going to be. Still, that's going to be tough because you're going up against right. the number five team in the country. Like right. that's nothing to sneeze at, you know. Right. So, well, in some years they would have been higher seated. Like, uh, well, in, in, okay. in uh, 2018, UCF would have had a buy. For example, they'd have been the fourth highest. Oh, like based on how things are, like how things work, because they were the eighth ranked team. That okay, year. yeah, you're right. There was another year where Cincinnati would have been an eight seed. Right. So so that that's my thing is like they're yeah. not always the 12. Right. That's some true. years they are, but there have been years where they were more eight, often than not, they will yes. be. But correct. Yes, correct. you're absolutely correct. But they, they, those two teams that we just talked about, they're not group of five teams anymore. SMU's not a group of five team anymore. That's true. So they're Houston's not a group of five team anymore. Like so some of those teams that were making those runs, they're now power five team or power four teams. So that yeah. factors into it as well. That's a good point. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. But it opens the door for some of these other conferences potentially too to send somebody to the college football playoff. You might get a Mac team in the college football playoff. You know what I mean? Just depending on how things go. So, but that, I guess that's what makes it exciting. So, all right, here we go. Another buy or sell. Caitlin Clark declaring for the WNBA draft. Even I talked about this before the show started with eligibility still on the table. She's a senior. She's got a fifth year option. So buy or sell Caitlin Clark declaring for the draft. I mean, I'm buying it is it, it, I'm not quite sure which one's which, but I'm buying the notion that duh. Yeah, I know. Right. I, I mean, like I didn't even realize because the only reason she has eligibility is because of COVID. Right. Like there's, she's been the, she's, she was the, like the number one or two player coming out of high school. She's been a star from the moment she got, I mean, the, the only surprise was she, she came back for this year. I mean, Jackie right. Young declared after her junior year. It's not unprecedented for a sure. female basketball player to go to leave early. You know what I mean? So, like, her coming back this year was a bit of a surprise for me. There's no way she's going for a fifth year. And, and like, there's this – well, you know, she's not going to make a lot of money in the, in the WNBA. Well, first what? of all, she's going to have a higher wow. salary in the WNBA she has at Iowa. Because here's the thing. All the endorsements she has now are not going to leave because she's playing in the WNBA. They might get bigger. Actually, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe either I mean, way. I, I, I don't yeah. know because the WNBA is not a real popular product. That's but, true. But WNBA players can be individual players Correct. can be. And the reality is, is Caitlin Clark has kind of gone mainstream Agreed. in ways that a lot of past great WM, college basketball players did not like Skylar Diggins and Brianna Stewart's and Brittany Griner and some of the best players they we've seen. That opportunity, She's really, gone yeah. more mainstream. Yeah. And honestly, it's I mean, her game is just different. And I know mm-hmm. that like people like to hate on her for whatever reason and people get jealous and, you know, but I mean, you know, some people just stone out just pure ignorance and she takes 40 shots a game, not even close to true. You know, she's a, older than Kelsey Plum, no, not even close. You know what I mean? Just, it's just like, but whatever, but that's a good thing though, because if people are hating on you, it's because you're relevant because yeah. oh, you're yeah. out there because you're a name and she's, I mean, there's a reason, with all due respect to LSU, there's a reason that the Final Four, women's Final Four last year was the most viewed ever, and it's not because LSU. Right. It's because Caitlin Clark. 
Mm-hmm. Let's, I mean, it, like she's doing, you know, and I was a good program before she got there, but they weren't like what she's made. She's been oh, there. gosh, no. So I don't even, I didn't give me the, the fact that this is even a talking point and is just, it shows you just how much clickbaity these things have become, but also shows you how her name sells. Yeah, we're talking about women's college basketball on our show. Because anytime you talk about Caitlin Clark, people tune in. Because for yeah. a lot of young girls, I mean, it's like, I mean, you're seeing, you're seeing, I mean, that's the biggest impact, but, but even more so there's more, there's a lot more young girls watching. She's become kind of like that role model for them. Sure. And, um, it, you know, and, and like, there's a lot of men that I've talked to that will watch her now. And it's not the sexist stuff. Well, you know, she's kind of hot or whatever. No, it's like, <laughs> dude, that girl's got game. Right. You know, exactly. like that girl's pull, call, pulling up at half court, dropping like her shot to pass Kelsey Plum's record was the most Caitlin Clark thing ever. It was like from the for one foot on the logo. Like, yeah. Come on. Right. Right. But that's how you expected her to break the record, right? right? I mean, you know what I mean? Like she was gonna break the record hitting a 30 foot triple. Yeah, like exactly. <laughs> but like it's just there's a respect for her game from people that are not looking that don't have an agenda. Right. There's right. respect for her game. No, it's just fun to watch. I watch her play and I'm like, I enjoy watching that girl play. Yeah. Like, just straight up. That yep. is that is some skill. Like she would embarrass me on the court. Like I just here, here's the one thing I want. I want somebody to go back. This is going to be somebody with a lot of time on their hands. Somebody to go back and watch all the film of Pistol Pete Maravich and give him the points he would have had for shooting threes. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. Well, say, I mean, I've I've made this case about Larry Bird. Not that he would set records, but like Larry Bird was scoring over thirty points a game his senior year, and there was no three point line. Right, you know for a fact he was hitting shots from you. Yeah, this Pistol Pete saying. was 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 yeah, his numbers would have been insane. Oh, I, I mean, I just. Unbelievable! What pull up his what his game film like? Yeah. Watching him is unbelievable, and I know she's about to pass him as like the all time college leader in points right. and everything. I just I would love to know how many points he now, would have had if there was a three. But here's line. the thing about Pistol Pete. Here's my counter to that. Sure. How many points per game would would Caitlin Clark be shooting if she was in fact shooting forty times a game? Because he did, and he did. I agree with that. I mean, that dude averaged right. thirty eight shots per game for his career. <laughs> uh, Caitlin Clark's like him hit like. Hovers around 20 this year. She's okay. over 20, but she was under 20 most of her career. Pistol Pete, the lowest he ever had was 37 and a half shots per game. I mean, that dude did, did shoot it. <laughs> he shot it. Crap he load put of it shots. Up. He put it up. So, yeah, but you're, you're De- correct. Decent he chunk of assists, too. The thing, yeah, that, yeah well, I mean, about five. I mean, that's the other thing, too, about, about Caitlin Clark, is she's not just a scorer. I mean, she's an efficient right. scorer, but she's like leads the nation in assists, I believe. She's like first or second. She, really she averages like seven or eight rebounds a game. Like she's not just a scorer. She's not a volume scorer. And that's what that's the thing that bothered me about what Cheryl Soup said. I just felt it was disrespectful to her game. Yeah. Like, like you're a former great player. You're a champion. She, you should be uplifting this girl. Right. Right. Like this girl's bringing prominence to your sport in a way that nobody has. You should be championing that, not hating on it for reasons that we all know that are obvious. You know what I mean? Like, Nothing that you said is even remotely close to true. Like, this girl has game. This girl is mm-hmm. bringing attention to the sport you say you love. You should all be championing that. Absolutely. And, and, and building it up because Not her be game hating. is phenomenal. Yeah. Her all-around game is outstanding. I mean, and, and she took an Iowa team that was would have been a tournament team without her, but a first-round, second-round exit team all the way to the title game. Mm-hmm. And – um and it was a highly watched title game too. Yeah, most ever, right? I yeah, believe. I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty it sure it was. Yeah, and 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 I mean no disrespect to LSU, but people weren't watching because of LSU, right? They were watching because of Caitlin Clark. Let's be right. real about that. All right, back to clickbaity stuff. According to one betting site, Notre Dame quarterback Riley Leonard is tied for ninth in Heisman Trophy odds, and to you, Brian Driscoll. That is blank. Fair. The only issue I had with it, Vince, was some of the guys that were ahead of him were like, come on, really? Exactly. That that was you know, my bigger like, issue. Without right. looking at it, I had no problem with it. Without right. looking at the list, my, just off my gut of what you sent me and you asked the question, I'm like, all right, that's fair. Like, yeah. okay, ninth. I mean, look, he played half a year last year. Now, if Notre Dame is really good and he just repeats the numbers he had two years ago, he'll be in the top five, just like Jalen Milrow was. I mean – Sure. I mean, l- l- let's let's look at the numbers just so I you, you all can understand what I'm saying. If you are a cor- if you put up good numbers on an elite team, you will get recognition. Last year, Jalen Milrow played thirteen, pardon me, thirteen games. 
In those 13 games, he passed for 2,834 yards, rushed for 531 yards, had 35 total touchdowns, okay? Six interceptions in 13 games. In 2022, Riley Leonard, in 13 games, passed for 2,967 yards, more than Jalen Milrow, rushed for 699 yards, more than Jalen Milrow, and had 33 touchdowns, only two fewer than Jalen Milrow, and nobody ever mentioned him as a Heisman Trophy candidate. Why? Because he's playing at Duke. So if he just repeats the numbers he had at Duke, at Notre Dame, they're going to be really good, Yeah, which is going to get him in the Heisman conversation. Yep, agreed. So, but, you know, five to eight, that's fair. My my bigger issue, as I said, Vince, was like, you know, Carson Beck, number one. (laughs) Garrett Nussmeyer tied for third. Right. You know, Nico Amialeva is number tied for third. Like Cam Ward. And then... What like really Will Howard, right? Yeah, Connor Wegman, who who w- played even less than Riley Mills or Riley Leonard did last year, was in that. So that was more of my issue is just yes. who, some of the guys that were in it ahead of him, right? And the fact that you have to get down to like number like twenty something before you have a non quarterback is just like okay, <laughs> is it really? Well, it's yeah. really small. Travis print, Hunter, obviously, yeah, is like. Yeah, there's 12 that are listed. He's tied for ninth, but he's one of 12 listed. Yes. Yeah. And then five, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So it's third, 24. Wow. Is before you get the non quarterback. And then, you know, you get Donovan Edwards later and Evan Stewart. So it was more so the, the annoyance of like, that's yes. who you have ahead of him, more right. so than it was he doesn't belong there. And that was my issue too, because when you think it's like when we, when we talk about, uh, you know, teams, this is a top five team. This is a, this is a top 10 team, you know, we, because it's, it, you, you look at them that way. It's like doing recruits, right? This is a top hundred kid. This is a top two fifty kid. Now who are the other 249 kids? That's a different conversation right. like this. Okay. You're going to tell me that he's tied for ninth. Oh, okay. Like yeah, I can get totally on board. With, like I can totally see fair. that. He still has just, a lot to prove. Absolutely, he's the quarterback at Notre Dame, and he's productive, and he will have I mean, totally hundred percent. It's all in his totally hands, fair. right? I mean, it, how he plays will will vault him up these rankings, whatever. But then you look at the people that they have in front of you, you're like, really? Yeah. Okay. Like Grant Garrett Nussmeyer, I think is my biggest kind of like really. Yeah, like, seriously. You know, right. like Nico, I think is ridiculous. He started one game, but he's a former right. five star recruit. Whatever, I get it. Right, but Cam Ward being there and and Garrett Nussmeyer, Nico, and just like right. come on, yeah. Connor Wegman, like really, yeah. some of these are really hard to see. Connor swallow. Wegman, yeah, and and Vince, you know, I'm a I love Connor Wegman. I mean, you know, I've I, I love that kid, but like guys, he he passed for 979 yards last year and 63 right. yards rushing because he got hurt after four games. Right. And as a true freshman, he only played five. Games. The guys played nine games in two years and you're making him a top 10 Heisman candidate. Like, seriously, can we not put that kind of pressure on this poor kid? <laughs> right. Like, that's where I'm coming from. Like, I love Connor uh, Wagner, but like, can we like let him play a full season's worth of games right, before we right. make him a top 10 Heisman candidate? Like, come on, seriously, guys. seriously. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It, but that's what this stuff is. It's his of fodder. It, it is all ridiculous, but of it's, course. Fun. it's fun to talk. It's also about. why I don't bet. I, <laughs> Right. Well, okay. One of the many reasons I don't bet, I should say. It. Yeah, I was going to say, I know there's more than one. All right. Last question. And this might be the longest answer. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm going to be as precise as I can with this, but yeah. All right. So we have not even had participation in the 12 team playoff yet for college football. And yet people are already talking about expanding it to a 14 team playoff in two years for, yeah in, in a couple of years so buy or sell the change from 12 to 14 i'm buying that it's going to happen i'm selling that it should happen there you go it's going to happen because the ac the sec sec and big 10 are going to bully their way into an expansion now the, the thing is they won't get as many automatic qualifiers they won't get four but that's the negotiating point to get the one they're comfortable with which will probably be like two or three Bill Trochi said this on on the CFP All America show, and he, he said this is a loser's mentality, and it's so short. I see so many people. Oh, you know, they're the two best leagues for now, but we don't know that that's going to be the case in two or three years. I mean, sure. you, you never know how things are going to. You know, what if Florida State doesn't leave the ACC and they get back to prominence? Miami gets back to prominence, and Notre, you know what I mean. And 
and and Clemson gets back to where they were. And all of a sudden, the ACC is good as anybody, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you don't know how these things are going to go. It's a loser's mentality. But at the end of the day, Vince, it's this. It's, it's this simple. I have said for years that the problem in college football right now is that they're not, there's no leadership. It's all about money. And there's mm -hmm. no justification for this other than money. You get yep. X amount of dollars for the number of teams you have in the playoff, and they want to guarantee X amount of dollars every year from the college football playoff. That's all it's about. And the fact that there's no pushback, uh, there's not a lot of pushback from the national media is, is another reason that's why this whole process is broken. The yep. reason politics is broken and the reason college sports is breaking is because the people that are supposed to sort of be the, the people's champion, so to speak, right? Government does their thing. The media is supposed to be sort of that. There's supposed to be a healthy animosity between yeah. the national media and politicians or coaches in the sports thing to where you know we should be the champions for the people for the student athletes and things like that and we're not because number one there's just a lot of people in media that just can't think beyond their nose mm -hmm. let's be real about that they just go along to get along and it's clickbait there's no there, it, real in-depth analysis doesn't sell investigative reporting doesn't sell ESPN wants no part of an investigation by their people taking on the travesty that is the education, you know, promotion of college students in the SEC. Why? Because the SEC is their meal ticket. Oh, yeah. And the minute they partnered up, there is no they're all on the same train because the yes, ESPN doesn't care if that's the case, because they're hosting all the games anyway. The SEC is one of their teams. It's good for them. Right. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's just the whole thing is an absolute joke. It's because we have no real leadership. There's nobody saying, hey, guys, we need to make sure the game is good. We need to make sure the game is healthy. We don't need these two super – now the Big Ten and SEC threatening to leave the NCAA. And it's just the whole thing is just – like they're so, they're so rid ridiculous that they make me sometimes defend the NCAA, which, which is, is just something I never want to do. Right, like that's right. a joke of an organization as well. So – it's just it, – it's all about money. It's all about power. Nobody cares about the game anymore. Nobody cares about the players anymore. You know, like for me, I'd say, fine, we'll go to this and we'll give you X number of dollars, but every penny that, you know, you, that you get beyond what your automatic champion get is going to get spent 50-50 between your, you guys and the players. Yeah. See how they feel about that. Right, right. right. It's, it's, it's all about money. It's all about power. It's all about just the 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 thing that's like like I I've went off on lawyers late. I got into it some wannabe, you know, champion of the people right. nil lawyer on Twitter last week, and the coward you know blocked me. He never actually responded to my to my pushback on him. He, you just know what you're talking about. That's all he said. You're just mad because things are staying the same. You're an idiot. You have no clue what I believe or what I feel. Right. And and my challenge to him was, you are just basically trying to replace the NCAA as the group of people taking advantage of student athletes. And here's what happened. Fans and players and coaches made the game great. And it became marketable. And then TV networks and all these people got involved because they wanted to make money off of the game. And what conference commissioners have become are basically people that are saying, this is a game that makes a lot of money, and we're going to milk it for every dime, even if it means we are leading it towards its destruction. Because once it finally goes off the cliff, we won't be around for that, right? And that's what it's kind of come down to. It's like, as long as we're getting ours now, I don't care what happens 10 years from now. Yeah. Or they don't think about what's going to happen 10 years from now because they think, hey, this is the biggest sport in America, and there's no way it takes a back seat. Go tell that to Major League Baseball. Because for 60 years, Major League Baseball was king of American sports. And then they canceled the World Series. And it's never been the same. And, and, and it's become a sport that people are just like, you know, this younger generation just, you know, why? What's so unique about it that this generation doesn't get it in ways for 100 years the generation's got it? Right. It's because you kind of ruined yourselves 
the way that you ran the game. You had owners who only cared about making money. You had players who only cared about making money. And in this process, people forgot about what made the game great. And baseball has not been able to find its way back to what made it great. And the problem is college football, because you don't have any leadership in any capacity, is you have people that are just saying, I just want to whore myself out as best I can to make as much money as I can. Mm -hmm. Game be damned. And that's the problem. No one is saying, hey, guys, what about the game? Because if the game no longer becomes attractive to the masses, then there is no more money to go exactly. around. And if I wanted to watch the NFL, I just would watch the freaking NFL. I don't need a college version of the NFL. Right. And that's what they're trying to create an NFL model in college football. And it'll work for a while, but I just don't see how it continues to work. Sure. And and at the root of it all is ESPN, who is absolute just crap. And 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 all these th just the utter lack of leadership we have, dude, at the political level, at the church level, at the sports level, it's just disgusting. It's just it drives me nuts. Well, as far as 12 versus 14 for me. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that they're even they're even suggesting or well, I shouldn't say suggesting because of course the Big Ten and the SEC are going to suggest it because they're going to try to get whatever they can out of it. The fact that it's even being because it's only about money, right? Exactly. There's no, there's no other reason to entertain it other than it right. guarantees us X amount of dollars. There's no oh, absolutely. There's no, I getting just, the best teams out there, getting the right. there, there's no other reason they don't to care justify about that, that besides money. Exactly. That, that's all they want. And they and they're all they're looking out for number one. And I get it. I get where they are coming from. But somebody it's got to stand up and be like, no. Some somebody, there has to be an adult in the room that's not going to allow them to do isn't. whatever they want to do. Problem is there isn't. I know. And that's, that's the problem. That's a sad thing. That's the problem. Because I'm sorry, I don't want to watch a playoff that has a guaranteed three teams from the Big Ten and three teams from the SEC, and then there's like one at large bid, you know, or whatever the case well, it'd be is. Like four, if they go to 14, there'd be like four, right? It'd be like that, three, three, two, two. Because like the four, the latest 14-team proposal being floated is three in the SEC, three in the Big Ten, then two of the ACC, two of the Big 12, and then one group five plus three at largest is basically what they said. Yeah, that'd be three at large, right? yeah. Uh, but that, like – like the only reason to go to 14 is because you get more, you get more of your teams in there, which means more money. That's basically what it comes down. Yeah. To. And it's ridiculous. That's not, I'm sorry. Don't, don't make the playoff bigger so that you can get more teams from the sec and the big 10. Cause that's all that it is. And that bothers me. I look, I get it. The, the, the conference champions. Yeah. You get your automatic bid. That's fine. But the rest should be the best teams in the country. But here's the other thing, Brian, my guess is, more often than not, in the 12 team playoff, there's a decent chance that three from the Big Ten or three from the SEC are going to get there. Right. There's a chance earn that it. happens. Earn it. Yes, exactly. Right. Earn, it. earn it. That That is my biggest thing. Earn the spot, and that's fine. If you get three teams in, in most years they will. Yes. In most years they are going to get three. They would have gotten three in last year, especially with the teams that are in the league now. Right. The SEC especially would have got three in yes. every year. The Big Ten would yeah. get three in a lot of years. So why do you have to be guaranteed yeah, eat it. it? Earn it. Right. I, I just I that's what I have. What, to it's a power with. play to force more teams to have to join their league, too. That's the other thing, too. Sure. It's a power play to try to say, hey, ACC, Big 12 teams, you need to get out of it. Come join right. us now. That's what right. it is. Yeah. Right. I, I like the obviously I like the big four being in the, on the same footing as far as how many they get in. I just I don't want to see them elevate two of the four conferences. I, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see them elevate it. You know what I mean? Don't make them better automatically make them earn it. Maybe they are better. We'll see that. That's the part that bothers me the most. So, and, and it's not because I'm, are. and it's not because I'm a fan of Notre Dame and it, it lessens the amount of at large bids or any of that kind of thing. Like that has nothing to do with my opinion. My opinion is solely based on now you're elevating the big 10 and the sec. And that's a major problem because you're just setting it up for disaster when it comes to college football in general so that's what i got the biggest problem with and that's with you, where man. we're gonna end it brother I'm so with you. sorry bro rita was going crazy over oh, I, each other, but i listened to i heard the morning. collar you're good yeah, you're on the same we're on the same page man yeah we did have two quick super chats yeah, I we did. To get to events before we get out of here man 
Anthony Solomon, our guy, he's always shooting us a super chat during uh, Ivy Nation. Appreciate you, brother. He says, thanks for the show tonight, gentlemen. Good to see the OGs together. You're not wrong. It's always good wrong. to do shows with you. Absolutely. Connor, our guy. Connor's an OG, frankly. Thank you for the super chat, my man. I remember the day Benjamin Morrison committed. The excitement you guys had then proved to be quite warranted. Yeah, he was. I, I, I That's one I never understood. Yeah, I I never, I never, I never understood why right. people like. How do you watch him and not are not thinking he's really, really good? Right. Like, I, I just, and I mean, like, you know, sometimes I'm like, well, I, I get it here. That was one where I'm just like, dude, I don't get it at all. Right. I, oh, I, remember, I remember you going off on multiple occasions uh, during that recruiting like, class. I don't know like, how that anyone watched that kid say he's not a top hundred player. Just never understood it. Right. I mean, and he's right. been that from the day he got here. I mean, right. that's the crazy. It's, he's been that way since from the minute he got here. I mean, and he didn't get here till fall. Yeah, I remember talking to a parent of another <laughs> cornerback who was like, "Dude, everybody saw it. That like the, the he like one of the first practices he was here. There was parents there, and they're just like they're all just gonna look around like, yeah, that kid's really good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like parents of other players are like, yeah, right. that kid's really good. You know right. what I mean? So, right. Yeah, that's special. awesome. He's that's special. awesome. So, so that's gonna do it do for it. tonight's show. Thanks everybody for hanging out. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, make sure you hit the like button, the subscribe button, the notification bell, share with your family and friends, get on the boards. If you want the intel, folks, it's on the boards. Yeah. It's the the best board money can buy. There's no doubt about that, man. Lots of great. I just somebody asked yesterday, Vince, about, you know, a younger. I'm a younger fan. I want to watch some Lou Holtz games. What do you remember? Again? So I put in like 15, 16 just clips of like like YouTube links to all a bunch of games from 88 to 93. All on one post. You can find that on the board. Nice. And uh, by the way, Vince, the ladies are up eight right now. So uh, in the, I still think it's the third. Uh, no, it's yeah. fourth. Just two. Oh, there's only two minutes left in the fourth. Yeah. These games are so quick. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, a huge win oh, if they can God. hold on, man. This is going to be massive because, well, you know, because Vatek is five. They're last time five. we did uh, buy so hold, you said buy so hold that the women get to host the first round. I said, I said, tell me after the Duke game. And that game really sparked them, man. And they've just been yeah. on fire ever since. Love it. And this would be huge because yeah. what's their ranking right now? They just went up 10. They're they're up. 17th. They're 17. They beat yeah. number five and keep this thing rolling, man. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, now they're now there's no doubt about it that they're gonna be right. And they got one more game against Louisville on Sunday before the ACC tournament. That's a big one. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That's a big one. Yeah, That's Louisville, one. uh Louisville got them last yeah. time at Louisville. You get them at home. So yeah. I was talking to Sean before the, the game, yeah, and he was feeling good about tonight. He yeah. said, he goes, I feel real good about tonight. He goes, I don't know yeah. if that means anything. He goes, but I feel yeah. real good about tonight. He so nailed it, man. He nailed it. felt good about something, yeah. Yeah, and awesome. Louisville's, Louisville's been tough on Coach Ivy, man. They've been yeah. tough on her since she got here. So it'd be nice to start to get control of that series or at least get some get back on an even plane with that series. Absolutely. So, I'd love to see a run cool. next week in the ACC tournament. So, But we'll see how, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, tomorrow – what do you got going on tomorrow in the afternoon? Do you have a plan? Yes. So okay. as of now, I have a interview scheduled for uh, 930 my time with a special guest. Ooh. I'm hoping that it's going to go through. And if he's able to do that with me, I'm going to play that. Okay. The first 20, 30 minutes. We have about a 30 minute window. And so we'll see. I don't want to say who it is because then I tell people Ooh, who it is. And then, and then they, get, they get disappointed. You know, yeah, yeah. Right. He that. doesn't show up or whatever. Yeah. But uh, that'll be fun. We're going to talk about Notre Dame and just wh where does this national insanity towards Notre Dame come from? <laughs> and this is from a non-Notre Dame person. Okay. So we'll see how that one goes. And then after that, Sean Davis and I are going to talk about that topic some more. Okay. And we're going to talk about, um, you know, just uh, – just, what, why this perception of Notre Dame exists and, and really what Notre Dame can do to shut this version up and then what follows then, right? Because they're not going to stop talking negatively about Notre Dame because when oh, Lou no. dominated, then it came on the, the tarnished dome and all these attempts to tear Notre Dame down. And yeah. so we'll kind of oh, yeah. get into to why that is and, and why it's so important to Notre Dame win this year and how Notre Dame winning this year could be something that slows down a lot of this craziness that is the sec and the big 10 and and then notre dame winning this year also secures itself to where notre dame can then become the team that they're all trying to get, throw everything they got at in case it is forced to join a conference why winning it winning big this year impacts that so we'll see how it all goes it's gonna be a lot okay. of fun 
Nice. And then tomorrow night, five o'clock, it's our normal Friday time, five o'clock. We got Friday fire. It would be me, Jesse, Sean. I do believe all three of us in the building doing some rapid fire can have some fun with it. I have a feeling there'll be some more talk about the potential 14 team playoff as well. So make sure you tune in all kinds of fun stuff to talk about tomorrow. So just keep it locked in right here, folks. Keep it locked in. Irish breakdown. Ivy Nation, the big show, all of it, we got you covered. And when you're not covered, when we're not live, get on the boards. Boards on Irishbreakdown.com. Ryan's got some updates on the boards, I believe, about the Combine guys. He's down in Indy right now covering that. So, yep, lots going on. There we go. So, keep locked in with Irish Breakdown. We will not let you down. So, for Brian, I'm Vince. It's time for dinner. We'll talk to you next time on Irish Breakdown Podcast.